Councilmember Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Holder? Here. Did we hear Brown? Here. Okay. Watkins? Can't hear you. Vice Mayor Myers? Can you hear me now? Who is that? Sandu? Vice Mayor Myers, we could we can't hear your sound. Vice Mayor Myers. I can't hear her. Uh, Mayor Cummings. Here. If there are any members of the public who would like to speak on this item, um, we'll move over to the public comment. Looks like there are two members of the public, and so we'll start uh, with public comment. All right. You're on the line. Member of the public, 3979, we're currently can't hear you. You must be muted, maybe? No, I'm not muted. Uh, pardon me, Mayor, may, may I take advantage of the lull to announce that the uh, potential litigation item relates to a threat uh, of litigation under the California Voting Rights Act by the um, claimant, uh, Gabriella Joseph, that will the council will be discussing in closed session. Thank you. Can I just, uh, I want to confirm, if possible, that you can now hear me. We can hear you. Please mark me as present. Thank you. Still can't hear the person calling in from 3979, unfortunately. That's me. That's me. That's Donna. Oh, okay. Okay, seeing no other uh, members of the public wishing to speak at this time, uh, we'll move into closed session. session of the April 28th, 
2020 meeting of the city council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting and we'll like also like to apologize for uh, being a little bit late today. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website cityofsantacruz.com. All council members including myself are participating in this meeting remotely and I want to thank the public for staying at home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on, on agenda items 4 through 20 with the exception of item 15, instructions are on your screen as follows. Call one of the following numbers. If the first number you dial is busy, continue to the next number until you get through. You can call in at 1-669-900-9128, one Council member is Byers. Here. Matthews. Is me? Yes. Didn't understand you. Yes, here. Uh, Brown. Here. Golder. Present. Watkins. Here. Vice Mayor Myers. Here. And Mayor Cummings. I'd like to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa-speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamuxin tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during the Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore the traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. And if the clerk could please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which we stand, <clears throat> one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we get, begin with our first presentation, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the celebration of Ramadan observed by Muslims worldwide as a month of fasting, prayer, reflection, and community. Ramadan goes from April 23rd to May 23rd, 2020, and I encourage members of our community to join our Muslim community as we reflect on our community during these difficult times and observe the Ramadan. The first item on our agenda is our presentations, quarterly update on the Resilient Coast Plan, I'll turn that over to Tiffany Wise West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. Tiffany, I think you're 
muted. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, very good. Um, good afternoon, City Council members and Mayor. I'm Tiffany Wiseless, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. I'm here today to update you um, on something different than when I was before you uh, two weeks ago talking about emissions reduction. Instead, today I'm going to update you on our uh, prime adaptation projects uh, entitled Resilient Coast Santa Cruz. I do want to mention that it is um, the first annual global adaptation month and as part of the city's commitment to um, adaptation, we've committed to completing these two projects that I will share with you our progress on today, as well as secure funding for a next step uh, resilience project called out in our adaptation plan. This quarterly update is required by our grant making agencies. And I would like to remind you that uh, the Resilient Coast Initiative broadly is um, our opportunity to develop, to develop the community's vision for a climate resilient future coastline. So how are we going to manage our coastline in the future in the face of climate change? So um, why are we doing uh, these projects? Um, we know that there are uh, potential issues to coastal access on our coastline uh, with erosion and so forth. We know that um, our coastline is relied upon for tourism and recreation, um, and that those are highly valued in our community. Um, we also have West Cliff Drive and our bimodal bike path um, that um, are part of the transportation assets uh, along our coastline that will likely need to be adapted. We also have sensitive ecosystems, uh, notably monarch butterflies, as well as other terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems uh, across our coastline that need to be considered in any planning. Of course, we have all kinds of coastal infrastructure from armoring to pipelines to structures. And we have some existing policy that likely will be updated as a result of these projects. Um, that pertain to management of the coast. Of course, here in Santa Cruz, we also have to be mindful of our strong sense of place and cultural identity, um, which is also incorporated into these projects. And I want to emphasize that we have been striving to really center equity in these projects. And I'll share with you a little about that in a moment. So in addressing these various topics, um, we are trying to create an inclusive conversation uh, to develop this community vision that has an eye out towards the end of the century, 2100 is our time horizon, and again, to achieve a resilient and equitable coastline. Again, Resilient Coast is comprised of two projects, the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan, as well as a beaches-focused project um, to develop local, local coastal program policies related to sea level rise uh, that support beach and public access protection. These projects are aligned in their timeline and they have a very similar but not exact scope of work. So it really made sense for us to couple these together. These projects began uh, really in earnest about a year ago. Um, we are advised uh, on these projects through a technical advisory committee of made up of 17 members of our uh, community, including uh, the mayor and both and the vice mayor uh, are on that tack. Uh, and we, as you will see later on, uh, there are a number of other groups that we are consulting with on this project. We also have an internal kind of core team um, working together uh, from various departments on this project. So the unique approach that we're utilizing that we feel is a very smart approach is using what's called adaptation pathways. So because of the uncertainty of when sea level rise related uh, and climate change related coastal impacts will really um, accelerate, instead we make choices or, or initiate projects uh, between short and long-term strategies through the use of triggers. So getting away from saying in year 2050, we're going to put up a specific seawall. Instead, we say, okay, perhaps there's a physical trigger 
that allows us to know the right time to begin planning and installing that seawall. And you can see here a number of different triggers um, that we are considering among others. Um, and we really want to have measurable triggers so that um, we do have that signal as to when to initiate a next step project. And what that looks like over time, our, uh, this is an example visualization of an adaptation pathway for Seabright Beach. So this is just one example. Uh, we are developing many different pathways for each of the four beaches, Seabright, Maine, Cowell, and Natural Bridges, as well as the West Cliff Pocket uh, Beaches, as well as four distinct segments along West Cliff Drive. So we will be developing different adaptation pathways that prioritize different coastal management goals uh, before we get into the process of actually identifying our preferred pathways. So starting on the upper left-hand corner, you see that um, our existing strategy, we have a wide beach, we have uh, a little bit of revetment or armoring and some sand retention uh, that comes from the West Harbor jetty. We can continue in that mode until we hit some kind of specific trigger, such as uh, a specific beach width or height. And from there, we might transition into, say, a living shoreline kind of application or treatment. For example, um, we could enhance the existing uh, natural dune, uh, I'm sorry, constructed dune that is already there with native planning to provide uh, a little bit more buffering on uh, coastal storm activity and uh, forces. And then another beach width trigger could cause us perhaps to reconfigure our jetty to capture more sand transport and build our beach up. And there could be some trigger at some point in time, whether it's beach width or repetitive loss or something else that may cause us to look at, okay, where might we need to relocate, say, um, the uh, first lane of roadway or um, the lateral sidewalk um, above the seabrook Seabright Beach, um, and that would be a retreat concept. So this kind of shows you how we are beginning to present these adaptation pathways. So in order to inform these pathways, of course, our two consultants, we have a great local consultant team that are working on both projects with different lead uh, consultants. Um, they are, of course, uh, providing their professional expertise, but we are also trying to educate and conduct outreach with our community to understand their preferences. And I will kind of connect this all together for you in a future slide. The first two rows of this extensive outreach um, has been completed already. And you can see it's pretty extensive, ranging from focus groups to uh, intercept surveys on West Cliff Drive that'll feed into the cost benefit analysis. Uh, interviews in our frontline communities of the beach flats and lower ocean area where we're gaining some really interesting insights that actually transcend beyond uh, adaptation and sea level rise. Um, we also successfully completed an open house on March 5th, right before uh, the COVID shutdown started. Had 105 people in attendance. That was um, a very well attended meeting for us. Of course, the virtual reality application, uh, phase one of that has concluded in the library, and we are working on phase two, which will roll out in a mobile phone application. And we are also looking forward to um, how can we adapt in-person uh, meetings into, say, virtual open house environments. Um, we also have been meeting one-on-one -on -one with historically underrepresented groups in the community, um, everything from uh, people of color to uh, LGBTQ to people uh, experiencing homelessness and so forth, and really have gained some very unique insights that are being integrated into the deliverables for these projects. And so on that note, I think we'll go ahead and talk about equity in this initiative. Um, this, these are really some reflections on how this iterative and experimental kind of practice is going in centering equity. Um, I really could do an entire talk on, on all that we're doing on equity, but, um, you know, from the get-go, we really um, have tried to intentionally spend time um, 
with frontline community leaders and historically underrepresented groups trying to build trust. Um, and I feel like we've made some progress in that regard and really worked with particularly our beach flats leaders in designing our meetings and our outreach techniques. Um, we also have leveraged academic partnerships to bring more capacity to this project to really focus long-term on fo uh, frontline communities. We are collaborating with um, Dr. Costanza Rampini at San Jose State University on the one-on-one -on -one interviews, and we'll be continuing that work. Um, and we're also partnering with the UCSC um, uh, Coastal Science and Policy grad program and have several projects related to equity going on right now. Um, as I mentioned, we've been meeting with historically underrepresented groups and we'll be following up with them. And then I just want to mention internal to the city related to health and all policies, some of these implementation actions are also really helping us um, to bring equity front and center, um, not only in the Resilient Coast Initiative, but to be wide and, and you'll see that there are a few items that I mentioned this below. So how does all of this fit together? And I'm not going to read through this, but I do want to give a sense of, you know, how the data that we are collecting flows into the outputs and the deliverables on the project. From the very beginning, starting to collect information about the uses, the, coast, the way people use the coastline and value the coastline. Um, that allowed us to really go into um, setting some goals for coastal management um, that we drafted with the Coastal Commission and prioritized with um, some of our teams um, in order to understand what, what goals um, are our priorities as we are thinking about trade-offs between some of these strategies. Um, from there, uh, we have determined uh, sets of strategies to analyze, both in the uh, short, medium, and long term, and start to begin to discuss what do those triggers look like that um, allow transition between the strategies. And that's kind of where we are at this point. We are now moving into the adaptation pathway recommendations that will be developed um, that will be informed by more in-depth feasibility analyses, a cost-benefit analysis, and more feedback. And then that really gets us to, if you look to the right, this vision that I started off um, the uh, presentation with. And really that vision will be articulated <clears throat> in the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan and the local coastal program amendment that will be coming to council by the end of the year uh, for adoption and then submitted to the Coastal Commission uh, after that to make it through their process. I should say that in addition to the other groups that I've mentioned, we're working very closely with the Coastal Commission, State Parks, and the Boardwalk as really key stakeholders um, in these projects to make sure we are all aligned uh, so that when we get to the end of these projects, um, we're all on the same page. So in addition to the existing conditions and future vulnerability assessment uh, that was submitted uh, last year, the end of last year, you can see behind um, these two colored blocks, um, one of the outputs from that, which shows um, high hazard areas and so forth, and all of that information is summarized um, in the documents that are at uh, cityofsantacruz.com forward slash resilient coast, and there's a document box there. Um, we did just receive our second set of deliverables from our consultants yesterday, so you will see that that website has been updated with our adaptation strategy and pathway evaluation, as well as a social vulnerability, uh, actually a socially vulnerable population impact assessment, um, which really I think is very unique in connecting the insights we've gained from our historically underserved and underrepresented folks into a planning document like this. There's a lot of interest uh, from the state on this uh, particular piece and the projects as a whole, I should say. Um, the next set of deliverables then uh, that are due at the end of June will be three sets of adaptation pathways for each of these uh, stretches of our coastline, the four beaches I mentioned and the four zones along West Cliff. And then of course the virtual reality phase two will also be out uh, by June 30th of uh, this year. 
And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. Are there any council members who have questions for Tiffany Wiseworth at this time? Council Member Brown. Yeah, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you, Tiffany, for all of your work and, and to your team uh, for working, you know, doing all of this outreach and really being uh, very deliberate about how we take input from the community and in particular uh, the low-income folks and, and potentially um, affected uh, areas of the town and, um, you know, just and thank you for presenting it to us in this really, really clear, understandable way. Um, I definitely appreciate uh, that there's so much work that's gone into kind of behind the scenes to get us to uh, something that we can kind of understand and know how we're moving forward. So just thank you again for, uh, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Council Member Flyers and then Vice Mayor Brown. Uh, can you get and, and potentially um, what's uh, that uh, I'm trying to okay Tiffany uh, you know all that's going on that I think is with our coast and of course I think Westcliff Drive with the uh, uh, the stay in place and all the tourists coming over and all the work I mean somehow is there something new that you're thinking whoa we haven't looked at that angle that may cause you to just take a deep breath and look at something else. Anyway, the impact. I'm um, not saying thank quite you. right, but I'm just uh, curious if all that's going on has juggled you at all or brought up something. Thank you for that question, uh, Council Member Byers. So uh, one interesting aspect of um, Westcliff Drive is that um, we're required by um, the grant making agency to look at um, going potentially to one lane on Westcliff Drive and, and to evaluate where might that make sense, does that make sense? Um, and I think, you know, our small planning team has really thought about with, with the COVID, you know, um, that could potentially be, a, a, you know, a test for one lane um, in the future if we would decide, you know, at some point um, to do that uh, to enable more space along Westcliff as people are utilizing that space. Um, that's one way we thought um, about the COVID uh kind of taking it as an opportunity, as a, as a test. Um, I'm not sure with timing, you know, whether that's going to happen or not. Um, but uh, that, that's really the extent to which we've kind of reshifted our, our thinking. Otherwise, um, I just do think that the project is very timely with respect to um, how space is allocated, mm -hmm. how we mm -hmm. utilize space, and how we ensure that our community's priorities are maintained uh, going forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Member, or Vice Mayor Myers. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to just, um, just quick remark. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to serve on the technical advisory committee of this um, effort and um, I just wanted to compliment Tiffany and, and all the staff working on this. Um, it's really been um, a really interesting process. And um, I think that we're doing something that I don't know that any really other city in the state is doing right now with regards to the scope and the breadth of how we're taking this analysis on and um, looking at those, both the social benefits, but also some of the uh, environmental benefits and ecological questions. Um, and really forecasting, putting ourselves out 50 years. And so um, it's been a really interesting process. I want to just compliment Tiffany. Um, both of the consultant teams we're work working with have been excellent, and uh, a lot of other city staff and uh, people from the community are involved in the technical advisory committee, and it's been a, a, a very good experience. And 
and so I just wanted to compliment, compliment the process and let other council members know what a groundbreaking effort this will be when it's all done. Thank you, Vice Mayor Myers. Council Member Watkins. I, I too just wanted to compliment the process and Tiffany as well, um, and just really also highlight how um, how important it is to build trust and to have an inclusive process that's really looking at equity. And we know that uh, with climate change, uh, public health and um, inequity can be pronounced, and um, and to be prepared and engaged and wanting to move in a direction that's more equitable, I think it's also really noteworthy. So thank you for your exceptional work and. Um, get much more time but great job thank you council member I, yeah, thank you. I um, I now do have a question. I was going to bring this up uh, on a later item around the um, shelter in place extension. Um, but since Catherine, since council member Byers brought it up, I thought I'd ask um, Tiffany, do you, in terms of this question about the, because I actually think, have been thinking about this too, the opportunity uh, of kind of testing partial closure on Westcliff. And I know some other cities have done this to try to create more space for people to be active. Uh, we've seen the challenges with uh, people kind of bunched up together uh, on Westcliff. And so I guess the question that I have then, if you also see this as a possible opportunity, do you have any recommendations about how we could move that forward? I mean, operationally, your thoughts, but then what the council might do to try to um, encourage that or move us forward? Thank you for that question, Council Member Brown. You know, I would like to uh, defer to uh, Claire Glogley on this question. Um, I know that um, the possibility of uh, one lane uh, being used for pedestrian and um, and or bike traffic has been discussed previously, um, but Claire would know best uh, where that's going and what the best way to uh, integrate into that conversation might be. So I'll let Claire speak. Yeah, good afternoon, Council Claire Glogley, Transportation Planner, and I've been working with Tiffany on this project. And then in addition to that, having uh, since COVID started, having a lot of conversations with our transportation partners and our public health partners related to this question, which keeps coming up, should we close one lane on Westcliff in response to so many people being there? And we've seen other communities doing it, but one of the uh, key tenants that other communities have done when they have closed streets or made slow streets is that they have done them on miles and miles of streets throughout entire communities rather than just in one location, which then serves to encourage more people coming to that similar spot. So at this time, closing one lane on Westcliff, uh, our, our thoughts are that that would bring more people there as a destination location rather than supporting the public health directives, which are to exercise in your neighborhood. Please do continue getting outside, walking and biking, but do so close to home. And so continuing to have the parking spaces closed at this time and continuing to really encourage people to stay close to home rather than traveling for recreation or exercise is what we're planning to continue at this point. Um, we're anticipating having more guidance come out from public health in you know, the coming days as we approach May and looking what we saw this weekend with so many people coming to town, I would be really, really reticent to encouraging larger and larger groups of people to come to a, a location that we would endorse for, for more active um, activities. I'd really rather encourage people to stay in their neighborhoods and exercise close to home. Although I'm looking forward to this project examining long-term in a planned non-pandemic environment, how we would look at Westcliff. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Hey, well, Tiffany, I'd just like to say um, thank you for all the hard work that you've been doing. And um, I think that, you know, given that this is this month, we've had to the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and that we're moving ahead. Um, so you know, we're at the forefront of kind of really making sure that we're, we as a community are ready as we continue to face the impacts of climate change. I just want to say that I'm glad that, um, that we're making progress, that we're planning ahead. And I think 
in the long run, we're going to be better off for everything that we're doing now. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And if I might say on that note, just to end, um, a study from last year um, indicated from the Institute of Building Sciences that for every $1 spent on hazard mitigation planning, that saves $6 in future disaster costs. So I think that's uh, very appropriate with your final comments there, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. So moving on. I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Calls from Kate Roberts. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment today are the numbers items 4 through 20 on our agenda with the exception of item 15 since council is not taking action on that item today. I'd like to ask the council members, are there any statements of disqualification today? If you have a statement of disqualification, I'd just like to ask that you please Press the blue button to raise your hand. Seeing none, I'd like to ask the clerk to announce any additions or deletions. We have done. Thank you. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak on items that are not currently on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately following agenda item number 20. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, Please call in towards the end of item 20. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Good afternoon, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. This afternoon, the city council uh, convened remotely at 11.30 a.m. for a closed session to discuss the following items. Item A was a, council, was a conference with legal counsel on liability claims, the claim of Sentinel Insurance Company Limited for WUN Property Management LLC. Item B was a conference with labor negotiators um, involving the following bargaining groups in which the council received a report from its chief negotiator, Lisa Murphy. Uh, these were the groups that were discussed, uh, Police Officers Association, Firefighter IAFS Local 1716, Fire Management Association, Police Management Association, OE3 Mid Manager and Supervisor Employees, <coughs> SEI, uh, SEIU Local 521, and Unrepresented uh, uh, Employees. Um, thirdly, the Council received a report from the City Attorney's Office with regard to the, a matter of pending litigation entitled. California et al. versus the state of Texas et al. This is a lawsuit um, in which the state of Texas and other states are challenging the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act in light of action taken by Congress in 2017 to eliminate the, um, uh, the individual mandate associated with that. Council, by unanimous vote, directed the city attorney's office to join in an amicus brief being prepared by the uh, County of Santa Clara and the City of Chicago and to be filed in the United States Supreme Court uh, in the early part of May. And lastly, there was one item of significant exposure to litigation, which the Council received a report from the City Attorney's Office on a notice of intention to file suit under the California Voting Rights Act that was brought on behalf of a registered voter in the City of Santa Cruz. Um, the claim alleges that an analysis of the city's at-large system of city council elections shows a pattern of racially polarized voting that results in the abridgment of Latino voting rights in the city. This afternoon, the council voted unanimously to direct the city attorney to enter into settlement negotiations with the claimant's attorney 
and to return at a future meeting with the resolution of intention to transition to uh, district-based elections for the November 2022 general election. And that is all I have to report for you today. Thank you very much. I'd like to call on the city manager to, to report and provide updates on city events and business items. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, will provide a, a, a report and cover three areas today uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic response. Uh, first, uh, beaches and the expected uh, revised and extended shelter-in-place order. Then uh, police enforcement and public safety considerations and that Chief Mills will, will, will present on that. And then third, uh, homelessness. Uh, the homelessness response, and we have uh, Susie O'Hara and Brooke Newman who will present, uh, and then I'll introduce uh, Brooke uh, before the presentation as well, who's a, our, our new employee. So I'll start with the beaches uh, and the uh, expected uh, shelter in order uh, that will be revised and, and extended. Uh, so as you all know, despite uh, efforts to increase public awareness and additional staffing to ensure compliance with the shift in place order, including the uh, social and physical distancing regulations. We did have a large number of visitors to our beaches, particularly visitors from out of the area, uh, and a lot of concern uh, expressed around that. Uh, and as a result, we are expecting a revised and extended shelter in place order uh, from health officer Gail Newell that will include significant more restrictions for beach access, as well as potentially uh, restrictions to focus uh, use on active recreation, including for example, the, the prohibition of beach chairs, coolers, umbrellas, uh, that sort of thing. We don't know what they will be uh, 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 yet, uh, but expect that the new order will be issued by the end of this week. Uh, we are, the different agencies are providing input into the process, uh, but ultimately the health officer will make a decision uh, and that order will be issued, uh, as I noted, likely by the end of this week. Um, we are communicating, like I said, uh, communicating and coordinating closely with the county, uh, the city of Capitola and state parks so that we can implement the new order in a way that's consistent to the extent possible across the county and so that we don't uh, also impact each other negatively. Uh, another area of concern that was raised uh, this weekend in particular was the hotel and vacation rentals where visitors appear to have used these facilities inconsistent or in violation of the shelter in place order uh, so uh, in response, we will be increasing, uh, we will be sending out notices uh, to all of our hotels, motels, and vacation rentals, informing of the regulations and enforcing as appropriate uh, as well. And uh, just wanted to point out that as a reminder, uh, uh, members of the public, if you'd like to receive the latest information on city services, as well as the COVID-19 response, to please visit the city's website at the uh, www.cityofsiannacruz.com backslash coronavirus. So we update the website on a regular basis with any of the changes that occur, and that's a good place to get information on all these, all these changes. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Chief Mills, who will present on the public safety considerations. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council members. Thank you for this opportunity to give you some information about what's currently going on. I think uh, Laura is going to bring up some uh, slides that we can go through just to give you some update and you can go ahead and forward, please. Uh, one of the concerns had were what would calls for service look like, uh, but at this point, uh, since the COVID crisis started, we are running essentially the same amount of calls for service as before. There was a slight, slight decline initially, but overall you can see that it has now um, gone back up and we are running at exactly what we were in the past. Okay, go ahead and forward, please. We've had uh, 374 calls regarding ordinance violations. This was as of 422. And uh, 26 of those calls required officers to wear universal protection, which means to uh, go in a, uh, all suited up with goggles and masks and gloves and so forth to protect our, our personnel. We've issued uh, 213 citations for a violation of the stay in place orders. 71 uh, of those individuals lived elsewhere, 98. In addition to that, probably lived elsewhere, but uh, that information was not available. 
We've also done a great deal of education, as you can see, thousands of warnings by our police officers, CSOs and Rangers, and our volunteers who have done an amazing job. And then uh, we've also had social media and then regular media that has reached into the millions. I cannot say that it has had a substantial impact educational piece on the on those getting from other places at this point uh, but we can evaluate that next one please uh, you specifically asked uh, mr mayor about uh, sexual violence and domestic violence and mental health calls during this time as you can see our sexual assaults are actually down quite a bit uh, next slide Our domestic violent calls have been fluctuating. You can see the uh, timelines between last year and this year. Uh, they're up a little bit this year. However, it has flattened out toward the end of the month and has gone back down. Uh, although we are seeing some uh, cases that are very troubling and concerning, we're paying attention to that in our investigative section. Next slide, please. Our burglaries uh, initially started off and going up towards the right part of the slide. You can see uh, the variations over time. However, they have gone back down uh, where we're seeing where commercial burglaries, however, um, are still taking place and our officers have uh, now reached almost uh, 10 people in custody for these burglaries. Thank you. Next slide. Death investigations are at a normal level uh, and then uh, suicide calls uh, um, are actually fewer than we have had in the past. And we're not really sure why that is, but we'll continue to watch it. Although, although we do understand that uh, calls to suicide hotlines are actually up in other places. So uh, we'll see if we can uh, get more data on that. And I think that's the last one. So certainly if you have any questions, I would, I would take them. We are continuing to put staff out on West Cliff as well as the beaches uh, to make sure that people are complying with the rules as best we can. Um, there are a lot of people out, though. Thank you. Are there any questions for the police chief at this point in time? Chief. Chief, I have one question. <clears throat> um, I was wondering if you can speak to um, how the city has been making efforts to increase um, not only police but other forms of um, uh, patrols for during the shelter in place? Yeah, so we adjusted our staffing model uh, from a 410 plan to a 312 plan, which means that we can put additional officers on the field, uh, out in the field around the clock. And that gives us um, extra bodies to go out there and police. In addition to that, uh, we have paid some overtime to rangers and CSOs, especially in the high traffic areas such as West Cliff and the beach to make sure that uh, people are being educated, warned and cited when appropriate. And so we feel like we have a pretty good handle on that portion of it. Uh, I also might add that this last weekend, for instance, the park and rec department also had um, employees out there in green vests, uh, educating people, talking to people and, uh, and doing everything we can to make sure that people understand what's expected of them by the public health officer and then the emergency executive director for the city, uh, the city manager. Great. And then um, this is a question for the city manager. Do we also have lifeguards currently uh, working on the beaches, or is that something that might be happening in the future? Uh, yes, uh, we, we had them this weekend. Uh, I believe we had uh, also on the, uh, um, the jet skis uh, out uh, enforcing. And actually, Jason might be able to add a little bit more on that. Uh, I think he's on the line. Hi, Mayor, uh, Jason Hyduke. Um, so yes, we do have lifeguards in service, but we're not following the traditional model of putting lifeguards in towers. Um, one, I don't want to send a message that we're open for business to have more people come. And also I don't want to expose them uh, to everyone walking up to their towers. But we do have a reactive rescue uh, force uh, on the beach in vehicles. And we do have PWCs in the water. Uh, we use them for making contact uh, prior to the closure over Easter weekend uh, with surfers that were in the water and we're making educational contacts and we are available for uh, medical calls and for water rescue calls, but it's not the uh, traditional deployment that we've uh, done in the past. Great, thank you. I think it's just really um, important for members of the public to know that the city is you know, taking this extremely seriously and we've 
you know, increase um, everything from rangers, CSOs, parks employees, you know, lifeguard, really out trying to engage and educate with members of our community. So very much appreciate that. Um, I will then turn it over to uh, Vice Mayor Myers, followed by Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Boulder. Yeah, thank you, Chief Mills, for this report. Um, I did just want to pass on just some, some comments I've received from the community. Um, there continues, I think, to be some confusion on enforcement um, and approaches, you know, in individual situations. So um, to the extent that we can utilize our public, um, public uh, media, social media, those kinds of things for people to really understand if they're contacted, you know, what's expected of them, why they would be contacted, and, um, you know, what kind of remedies are going to be expected. So whether that's um, a citation or just asking them to, you know, move off the beach and, 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 and stop the activity. Uh, I think there's, I've gotten reports of sort of uneven approaches just from people kind of either experiencing it or viewing how we're approaching it. So, you know, I, it's a, I compliment all of our all of our staff on this monumental situation that you're faced with to try to to really manage this. But to the extent that we can um, potentially just keep using the social media and other aspects to really communicate the expectations for either uh, visitors if they are here, um, but also for local people, I think it would be very helpful. And uh, hopefully, we can get into a rhythm with with behaviors and expectations moving ahead. And I think that that will. Uh, obviously help our community at, at, at large. So thank you for your efforts. But I just wanted to pass on just that information. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Brown. Uh, hi, thank you, Chief Mills. I um, really appreciate the kind of breakdown of information that you provided and want to thank you for, uh, and everybody on the, um, in the SCPD for uh, responding nimbly and, uh, you know, uh, effectively, uh, I think, uh, to the current environment. And um, so I wanted to ask you, though, when because calls for service being steady doesn't necessarily tell us um, or get at the, the energy and the time that's expended um, for the, you know, calls. I mean, the nature of those calls might be different or... You know, um, so I'm just wondering. One, that's first. The first question: Is there anything else that you could say to help us understand what what's going on um, for you all? Um, this is kind of a you know late question about labor practices, um, and then um, so like the burden on you know beat cop beat uh, officers versus um, others. And then I also was wondering if you have any thoughts on the mental health hold being down by that uh, that amount. That was just interesting to me to see. And so those are my questions. Thanks. Yeah, the uh, the burn is exactly the same on our beat officers and rangers, those who are out there in the handling stuff, they are still uh, dealing with many of the same problems uh, as before. So I don't see that as a whole lot different. Um, I think the, uh, uh, the, the same type of crimes are taking place. We're still doing de-escalation. We're still uh, dealing with people who have severe mental health problems. But uh, on the other portion of your question of you know mental health holds, um, I think there are a couple reasons for that. One is there aren't as quite as many people out and about to observe the um, people acting out and having um, significant mental health issues. But uh, when we see our calls for um, people in crisis who are threatening suicide are down, um, that also is an interesting uh, thing to me. Maybe families are more available. And um, I'm just speculating. I have no idea for sure. But uh, we were taking a look at and try to figure out why that would be down that far. That is uh, uh, certainly something we need to take a look at. So thank you for the um, information. And I realize that nobody in this meeting has control ultimately over what decision um, about the beaches is. It is county public health. But that being said, like, 
I encourage members of the public to reach out to her with you know their issues. We've been um, I know my inbox has been flooded with concerns one way or another about this, and then from the perspective of that schools are closed, kids are home cooped up, and I think for the physical and mental health of the community, it's important to keep um, people active and being able to recreate in whatever way at the beaches. And so just keeping that in mind that for our community, it's really important. And so one thought was, has there been any press release directly? I know there's been social media stuff, but like an exact press release just for like Bay Area and like Santa Clara County uh, news outlets stating stay in your county, this kind of information, because uh, I think that could have an impact and, you know, paying bump the fines and fees and all sorts of things, too. Okay, if you're asking me a question, that last part was broken up, but I think I got the gist of it. Has, has there been press releases? And yes, there have been press releases. I, um, so I was thinking specifically, though, targeting like other cities, not our city, like Bay Area cities. Maybe Ralph um, could speak to this item. Yeah. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I know, um, you know, Tony um, Elliott um, has been working with um, park and rec directors from other cities, um, from state parks and other counties as well. And we did issue a press release that was really targeted towards um, residents outside of our county, um, residents who um, have been, you know, um, visiting our beaches and, and stuff. And um, we also did a few um, interviews with TV stations in, in those cities as well, letting them know of um, the uh, closures that are parking lots and um, just informing them that um, now is not really the time to um, visit um, our community, especially with the shelter in place orders. And that um, we did have um, officers out there um, citing um, individuals for um, not following shelter in place orders and all of that stuff. So um, yes, um, communication has gone out to um, areas outside of our area. And just to um, follow up with that, uh, this past yesterday, I actually did an interview with Cal and explained to them that we didn't want you know visitors at this time. Um, on Saturday, did an interview with Kay Harlan up in San Francisco, letting them know the same message. A uh, article had been published um, in Orange County about making plans, solar plans to come to Santa Cruz, and. Um, uh, Supervisor Coonerty and myself, we wrote a letter to that publication asking them that for right now, can they please pull that down to not encourage folks to start making summer plans while we still have the shelter in place order in effect. And um, earlier in the month, there was around the time when we had the uh, Easter closures, there was a, a public service announcement from myself, Supervisor Leopold, and, um, and the Mayor of Capitola urging people to not come here during that time. And it sounds like that might be getting reworked so that we can release that and have that ongoing, really encouraging people to not come to our community and, and to continue sheltering in place. Okay, I guess I'll turn it back over to the city manager to continue, and thanks again, Chief Mills, for that update. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll first introduce Brooke and then turn it over to Susie and Brooke who will do uh, an update on the uh, homelessness response. So um, as you know, we recently hired Brooke Newman as the city's first homelessness response manager. Uh, Brooke started on April 6th and has really uh, uh, gotten into uh, the COVID-19 response very quickly, uh, playing a, a critical role at both the city and county level in planning and uh, I'm sorry, putting into uh, implementing the county's incident command system uh, plan for the homelessness response, which uh, is evolving and changing. So she's very involved in, in that role. And uh, with uh, Brooke's experience managing the downtown streets team, uh, sitting on the city's community advisory committee on homelessness, the cash committee, and also just serving on many local committees on the area of homelessness, uh, our expectation is that Brooke and her work with city staff and our partners at the county and with service providers and other stakeholders in the community will make an immediate impact 
for the city and the region now as we deal with the pandemic, but uh, moving into the future as uh, homeless is an issue that uh, we will have to uh, confront and, and work on uh, for some time to come. So with that, we're very, very happy to have Brooke uh, on board and, and to have that additional resource and focus and effort. And uh, I'll turn it over to Susie now and, uh, and Brooke. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martine. And it's my pleasure to also introduce um, and congr congratulate Brooke on this assignment. It's obviously quite a relief to me <laughs> to have additional team members in the city manager's office that are focused on homelessness. So good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and council members. I'm gonna share my screen and Brooke and I are gonna walk through some um, slides uh, around COVID related response um, to homelessness. Some of this information is gonna be uh, reshared from the last time I made a presentation at council. Um, and then we do also have new information to share with you all. So let me share my screen. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. Um, so as I mentioned, um, some of these slides are a bit of a review from the last time that I presented, um, but I did wanna talk about uh, really the overarching policy guidance that the county is using through their incident command system, which is technically called the shelter and care doc um, and has been called through the media and through press releases and um, out in the community through engagement, the Regional Homelessness Task Force on COVID. So as we have considered what elements to put together in response to COVID-19 and considering um, transition potential of the virus within the homeless population, we really have looked at um, overarching policy guidance that's been provided at a national level. In addition to the CDC guidance that has been updated several times over the last few weeks, um, the National Alliance to End Homelessness um, created a report that they uh, disseminated on March 23rd, which obviously talks about um, how, what best practices should local municipalities consider as they um, try to minimize spread of the virus, protect health and the health system infrastructure from a potential outbreak within the homeless community, minimize economic impacts across the community, and then also obviously care for the entire community, both housed and un unhoused alike. Um, that plan was built in um, concert with the other organizations that you see the logos here, the National Health Care for Homeless Council, National Association for Community Health Centers, and the United Healthcare Community and States. Um, as, a, as a review, I wanted to um, quickly go over again the structure for homelessness response within the COVID-19 pandemic. The lead agency being the County um, of Santa Cruz through the Homelessness Task Force, which is managed through the Human Services Department at the County. Each jurisdiction, um, city jurisdiction within the County supports that work with both the City of Watsonville and the City of Santa Cruz having members of their city manager's office sit on the policy committee for that task force. Across the spectrum of um, supportive services that the county is um, providing are, include shoring up our, and supporting our existing shelters, especially congregate shelters that have had high density um, sleeping arrangements. Those have all been, um, uh, those congregate settings have all been minimized um, and we have moved folks uh, from the Salvation Army, for instance, shelters in both North and South County and the Poly Loft into new shelter capacity to ensure that social distancing can be achieved. Um, in addition to that, providing distributed safety net services such as food and creating um, new pop opportunities for unsheltered individuals to engage with the system of care and shelters. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. Hello, council members and mayor. It is an honor to serve the city and to start at this time has been quite the education. Um, so as many of you probably know, the county of Santa Cruz is taking the lead on um, acquiring the different types of shelters that we need for people experiencing homelessness. 
um, with the referrals that Susie mentioned in terms of decongesting and decompressing the shelters that were in place, um, the county has been taking folks experiencing homelessness that have been potentially diagnosed or exposed to COVID-19, highly med medically vulnerable or over the age of 65, or have other underlying conditions as defined by the CDC um, into the isolation and quarantine shelters, which are in um, a variety of hotels throughout the city and also the county. Um, service providers have been making those referrals. Um, they've also, we have also worked on expanding congregate shelter. So making sure that there is space for the people who are already served there. Um, but we have additional capacity now in places such as the Veterans Hall and a barracks tent up at the Armory. Um, so we are able to serve more folks. Um, and then we are also doing work to ensure that folks who are unsheltered in encampments can safely socially distance while they're out there and provide them with the resources they need to stay safe to stay safe outside. <laughs> Next slide, Susie. Right. And Susie and I will be discussing some of the immediate action steps that we've been working on in conjunction with the county and service providers um, throughout this time period. Um, Susie, would you like to start? Yeah, so um, per the National Alliance to End Homelessness uh, guidelines set forth in their document, there are these six um, particular areas that they are recommending for local jurisdictions, both city and counties, to focus on as concrete action steps. Those include, include reorganizing and redeploying existing shelter, which we have locally um, moved forward with, and additional uh, sites will be identified throughout the county moving forward, lifting any ordinance and require 24-7 shelters. So every shelter um, within our regional system has moved that was not 24-7, has now moved to 24-7 operations. We are currently uh, providing day services for folks at the Laurel Street Shelter at the Armory rather than um, having those folks go out into the community during the day, for instance. And I think of the 16 shelter uh, providers within the county, all 16 have gone to 24-7 operations to ensure those that are receiving services can safely shelter in place at those locations. Um, we have created additional capacity to safely house people at risk while supporting the local hotel and motel service industries. As Brooke mentioned, uh, this, the county uh, has contracted with uh, now two hotels within the city of Santa Cruz. They are looking um, towards finalizing a lease agreement on a third hotel. Those hotels will be uh, exclusively used for, it's called IQV, isolated, quarantined, and vulnerable um, populations. Uh, those include obviously folks that are either COVID positive or under investigation for potential exposure, symptomatic, as well as those that are 65 and older and or medically vulnerable. Um, one hotel with a bed capacity of 27 is currently in operation with another uh, hotel opening up tomorrow, um, some, somewhat of a soft launch. And we're moving folks around to ensure that um, we have enough capacity should there be a surge of COVID positive um, individuals in the unhoused population that we have the ability to move folks into um, additional rooms as we bring them online. On that note, there have been no uh, reported and verified cases of COVID-19 within our homeless population. Um, we have a few folks that have been tested um, that have come back negative. There are a few folks in the IQV shelter that's currently open now that are awaiting um, test results, but nobody um, within our current homeless population has tested positive um, yet with regard to um, the COVID-19 spread. In addition to that, obviously I've mentioned this already, following protocols for quarantining individuals that is happening through the hotel rooms, 
expand medical respite care. Again, these hotel rooms are really a medical um, response. And so anybody who does not require hospitalization um, is provided medical attention at these hotels. And then working with housing providers to plan um, on transition for individuals into supportive housing. Obviously that is a big part of demobilization and recovery. Um, and those supportive services uh, will be part of the COVID related shelter system that we are putting in place with the county right now. Um, as we work through funding and other considerations, those supportive services will come online as um, staffing and other kind of resource requirements are, are further um, realized. Uh, Brooke, I'm realizing I went through all of those and we were supposed to tag team. I'm sorry. Anything you else you want to anything else you want to add with that? No, no, I'm happy to dive into the next slide. Okay, I'll I'll advance. Okay. All right. So just to give you all an outline of some of the additional work we've been doing with the county and a variety of service providers. Um, we have been doing outreach and engagement with the unsheltered community members. Um, you may have heard of this, They're, we call them HOSSES, that's the Homeless Outreach Service Site. Um, we have two locations currently in the city of Santa Cruz. There are one or two potentially down in Watsonville, and we're hoping to bring three more online here in Santa Cruz. Um, the purpose of these outreach sites is to make sure we are providing resources to those who um, don't necessarily feel comfortable going into shelter. We want to ensure they have the ability to safely socially distance, that they have water, that they have food, that they have supplies. We have medical staff going out to see people um, and teams that just go out into the neighborhood these sites are located to perform outreach. It's also meant to ensure that folks aren't traveling throughout the community um, and risking their own health and potentially the health of others. We've additionally deployed new hygiene resources, porta potties, and hand washing stations throughout the community. Um, locations for these can be found on the City of Santa Cruz website on the COVID 19 page. There is a legend at the bottom of the map that allows people to see the times that these resources are open, which ones are 24 7 and available to all. Um, we keep iterating. Um, community engagement plans. We're constantly, um, it says it's created, but we're just, as we move forward day by day changes, um, working with the unhoused service providers, um, county physicians, um, we're just trying to engage with as many folks as possible. One of the most exciting things that's happened is we have a streamlined shelter, shelter referral process now. So this is a way for people to get um, referred into the expanded shelter programs. So there's a phone number people can call. It's rather small here, but it's 831-291-5098. Um, when that number's called, um, a person will be assessed for their needs, their vulnerability, and triaged. Um, there's also an email address, which is quite lengthy, COVID-19 homeless response at Santa Cruz County .us. Um, We've also worked with the county to help create a new temporary workforce. So the city staff um, initially was helping to recruit and interview um, disaster service workers for the county. We reached out to a variety of service providers, um, including the Homeless Garden Project, Housing Matters, Families at Rebley, Polly Loft, Paige Smith, et cetera, um, and were able to recruit many folks with lived experience to um, become employed as hosts and shift supervisors at the variety of shelters um, that have been operationalized. Um, Altogether, we've created new service provider guidance, and I think we're calling it PPM instead of PPE because of the great <laughs> equipment. Um, but there's training and all sorts of guidance available for all the new staffing and those um, who are managing the new um, sites. And additionally, a new transitional age youth shelter program has been operationalized as well. Oh, muted. 
sorry. So other considerations that I wanted to briefly touch on with the council are food not bombs, budget and funding and encampment management. So as um, there, I know that there have been a number of emails that have come through to the city council email box with regard to the executive orders that the council will be considering later. Um, what I did want to comment on that, this with regard to food not bombs uh, operation is that the city, um, by virtue of trying to ensure that social distancing is maintained per the county health officer's orders around food distribution, um, has been working in earnest to ensure that food not bombs operation is um, safe and healthy for those that are receiving this important and critical service during our um, crisis, during this incident. Um, we provided Food Not Bombs with an opportunity to um, have a permit at the bench lands where we know that there's potential for um, expansion and additional social distancing measures, uh, provided hygiene resources, sanitation resources, as well as um, uh, platforms for the operation to be off the grass. In addition to that, because uh, we saw some rain after the permit was issued, we um, allowed for Food Not Bombs to also operate in the event of rain in the River Street garage. Unfortunately, even with our best efforts, um, Keith McHenry and Food Not Bombs has decided to not comply with the location requirements of the permit and now we're operating from, Laurel, from the Laurel um, Front Street uh, parking lot. And uh, we are really working with the county, environmental health, and others to, to determine the best path forward to ensure that um, food rate resources are out in the community for those that are unsheltered. But within the city's jurisdiction, we are not allowing for large social ga gatherings that do not comply with the shelter in place order and the social distancing guidelines that are required during this time. Um, it has been challenging uh, to say the least. Uh, Food Not Bombs is, is somewhat in compliance and somewhat not. Um, so what we really are trying to do is bolster alternative food um, options uh, within the community and are working in partnership with the Santa Cruz City Schools on providing food for folks that are unsheltered. In addition to that, Brooke is working with the county EOC and ICS structure to ensure that a food program within the unsheltered community that is not currently sheltered um, does have access to these important resources and I know has been in contact with a few organizations that Mayor Cummings has been working with for the last several weeks. So I wanted to provide that update on Food Not Bombs. In addition to that, budget and funding are obviously gonna be a huge consideration going forward and especially as the city and other local jurisdictions and quite frankly, the entire state and world are going to be um, hit so hard with the budget implications and revenue implications associated with this pandemic. Um, the good news is, is that Governor Newsom um, has worked very diligently on creating um, stimulus and other uh, reimbursement opportunities for municipalities and local continuum of cares to um, engage with. And under um, his new legislation and executive order, there is potential for significant FEMA reimbursement, but it does require cash flow and it requires a local funding source, um, you know, on the ground now in order for us to make some of these big um, budgetary consi considerations and really um, put the fiscal resources towards the program that we need. Um, right now, I think we have upwards of 600 people um, sheltered, uh, which is obviously quite a bit more than what we ha had uh, pre-COVID. And the budget projections um, moving into the next several months that the county is really focused on um, are on the order of six to $7 million. Um, but with much of that hopefully potentially being reimbursed through FEMA and with other federal and state stimulus funding. 
So as we know um, and get more information on that in the coming weeks, we will be providing additional information. And obviously, Martine and Cheryl will be um, sharing that with the council moving forward. And lastly, um, but not least, <laughs> encampment management. Um, as I just wanted to share with the council members our um, continued um, uh, our continued need to manage uh, encampments within the COVID response. Um, with CDC's, guide, CDC's guidelines around um, not disrupting encampments, the challenge with that um, particular uh, recommendation was there was little consideration of the management of encampments within the context of ensuring that one, social distancing is taking place, two, hygiene resources are available, and three, um, if encampments um, are a significant health risk due to density and um, proximity to other areas of high utilization for the community, we have to make sure that um, those risks are minimized to the extent possible. Um, so at areas like Coral Street, at the Benchlands, with RVs on the far west side, we are working um, with the county very closely to create opportunities to restructure those locations, to um, create additional order um, and management to ensure social distancing, providing additional hygiene resources and engaging um, through outreach to ensure that those folks that are sheltering in place outside in the community, especially in our urban interface, are doing so in a way that um, does not increase the risk of disease transmission within um, the encampment itself and within the community. So as we have more information on that, we will be sharing that um, through the city manager as well. And that concludes Brooks and my presentation and happy to have any questions if the mayor would like to proceed in that way. Sure, are there any, well, thank you for that um, very, well, that in-depth presentation. And I'd just like to say to the members of the community, um, Dr. the vice mayor and myself have been working on the two by two very closely uh, with um, county supervisors and the staff between the county and the city to ensure that we're able to bring on resources as quickly as possible. Um, there are challenges when it comes to trying to bring these resources online, but uh, we've been doing, and the staff has been doing, a really fantastic job of trying to get these resources online as quickly as possible. So thank you, Brooke and Susie, for all the hard work you're doing. <clears throat> and Brooke, welcome to the city as well. And so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to council members if anyone has any questions. And I see council member Brown has her hand up, so I'll um, turn it over to you. I thank you for the update and all of your good work and welcome, Brooke. I'm glad to have you on board. Uh, so that was a lot, and it sounds like you've been, uh, you know, you've been working overtime. I imagine as many people have um, in this challenge, in these challenging times. Um, I just have a couple of questions in relation to your presentation, just to clarify a few things. Um, so. And a couple of them I'm just going to get over so we can move along. Um, so in terms of the, um, for hygiene facilities and, um, you know, so hand washing and, and uh, portable porta potties, is it possible for us to get an updated list? I know we've, it's come up and we've had lists distributed in various forms, um, but I imagine it's changed. And so I'm just wondering if we could get a list. It would be helpful for me to share with people when they bring it up to me and constituents. Yeah, ha happy to do that, Councilmember Brown. Um, the, most, the, the most updated uh, map is on the city's website, but we will okay. share a link with you on that. Oh, that's okay. If it's there, yeah. it's already there, I'll go grab it. Thank okay. you. And um, the other question I had is related to Food Not Bombs. Um, so, you know, I have heard a lot about this uh, issue and I'm, you know, I'm trying to find a way to, um, you know, help make sure that that um, program can function in a beneficial way. Um, they do feed a lot of people. Um, and I understand that the, one of the issues with the compliance that you raised, Susie, was the, um, 
not complying with the sites that are attached to permits. Um, and then there have been some issues around the social distancing, the six foot requirement, which seem to, I mean, I'm not there every day. I don't, I'm, I'm trying to follow the rules and shelter in place, but I have seen, you know, some images and, and pass by and it looks like they are in compliance there. So what are the, are there any other issues of, for, that are of concern related to the compliance? You mentioned uh, environmental health. So if you could just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and I, I wish I had the permit in front of me, but sadly I do not. But we worked with Marilyn Underwood, uh, who is the Director of County Environmental Health, and her team to establish what, quite frankly, would be the expectations for any food distribution within the community um, with the overarching philosophy that we are really intending, and this is the city and county and public health officer alike, to not be permitting and or inviting any type of congregate um, social, whether it's food distribution or not, situation. Um, so with regard to the conditions that Food Not Bombs is not in compliance with, I think it really gets down to the nitty gritty that's within the permits. In addition to the social distancing requirements, food handling requirements, who does that, level of sanitation, I mean, it really does get down to are there, is there sneeze protection, um, thing, you know, is the area covered, who is handling food, how, you know, what does the congregation look, around, look like around where food is being handed out? Um, does, the, does the operation include additional congregate um, activities? Uh, what Food Not Bombs is doing in addition is passing out clothes and obviously other very needed things, but it does lead to a high level of congregation in a very small area. Um, and so what we've asked Food Not Bombs to do is to transition to a takeaway model. Um, we offered him, or I offered Keith a few weeks ago um, resources to do that and have ordered those. Those are at the city, city office right now, so takeaway um, materials. Um, so you know, it really does get to the specific conditions that were laid out by County Environmental Health that we included in the permit. Um, and the siting is obviously quite critical. We've also had a um, lot of concerns from folks, uh, staff and, and members alike of the bank that's uh, directly adjacent to Food Not Bomb's current operation, um, really having a challenge with uh, kind of navigating through congregation of individuals as they are seeking um, support, business support in particular during this time at the bank. Um, so with that all being said, obviously very complicated, nuanced answer, um, and it's not just as simple as uh, the six foot rule. Thank you. I, I appreciate that it's very complex and shifting sorry, all the time, sorry, but Sandy. I did want to raise it. Really, yeah. I, I just wanted to raise it because we've, we've had, you know, had a lot of uh, uh, messaging about it and I like to know kind of as much as I can in my response. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. That's very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Susie and uh, Brooke for your presentation, and Brooke, um, thrilled that you're here working with us now at the city, um, bringing a lot of your experience and and uh, knowledge to the to this to this issue. Um, I just had a just more of a, a just a very basic comment. Um, I appreciated in your first slide um, sort of the guiding policy and the guiding um, technical guidance that you guys are um, utilizing to develop our response. And um, I think it's really important for our, our community to understand um, uh, on that first slide the set of, uh, of expertise that you're seeking through various um, national agencies and organizations. And um, I think if there's one thing I've sort of learned over the last six weeks in communicating with our fellow elected um, leaders over at the county as well as the county staff is um, the, per, the, the professional approach and the, um, the true intent to um, acknowledge the um, difficulty of 
people experiencing homeless and keeping them safe during not only this emergency but in general. And um, I think we've, in a sense, learned a lot by being forced into this situation. And I think um, utilizing those technical guidance documents uh, is a is a really refreshing thing to see um, from our service providers in terms of really looking at what we do, what are other, what is going on nationally, what are the guidances that are coming out of uh, both medical as well as uh, emergency personnel as well as experts on um, homelessness um, nationally. And so I, I just, um, I know it's sort of a little bit out of need at, because of the situation we're in, because of the COVID-19 situation, but I just want to compliment um, both our internal team at the city as well as our county partners on the level of um, uh, just the level of, of professionalism that everyone is approaching this with. And um, I've been very impressed, um, and I appreciate uh, folks taking the time to really seek out all that national guidance so that we can make, uh, make hopefully, uh, not just immediate impact, but hopefully actually resetting and um, essentially upping our game here in Santa Cruz and really um, understanding how to uh, approach this serious problem that we have here. So uh, I just want to say I appreciate that, and um, I feel very happy with the way that uh, our city and county staff are working on this, as well as um, I certainly think we will be seeing some true benefits to the folks who are in time of need right now. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Council Member Watkins. I'll, um, I'll echo the comments that have been made. Welcome, welcome, Brooke, and uh, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to share with you that uh, a woman who I work with had volunteered for a shift actually at the home at the transition age youth shelter, and um, was sharing how one of the participants had felt safe and finally felt safe and cared for. And I think um, I just really want to highlight how important it is to really uh, look at these subpopulations, uh, these vulnerable populations, and all the wonderful things that are um, really changing in a positive way for their lives, um, especially our transition age youth who um, are either transitioning out of foster care or um, just don't have those safety nets that some of us are so uh, privileged to have. Um, one of the questions that I have, and I apologize, I had to step away for a second, but do we have, or how is the county looking at the employ, like to employ those folks to help be the, the folks that are going to oversee some of those shifts so that they can get some money in their pockets? Um, how, how is that looking? So it's, it's looking very, very positive, and there is um, a call out uh, for anybody who is interested in looking into employment at the county during this time um, in the shelters, uh, both the motel, hotel, IQV shelters, as well as the congregate shelters that we're opening up. I think um, we have interviewed, and Brooke, we had, a, we had a slide on this just yesterday, and I should have included it because the numbers are really unbelievable. I think we've um, engaged with over 150 people, and I think they've hired about 70 people thus far. Um, for both shift supervisors and shelter hosts. Um, those positions, um, as Brooke mentioned, uh, we started the recruitments here at the city because we had been um, hiring temp workers to help at the armory for a number of weeks. Um, and then did just recently, a couple weeks ago, transition that all the way to the county. So they're doing all the recruitment um, as well as hiring and um, all of the onboarding and training. Those extra help, Disaster service workers are obviously temp workers um, for the county. Uh, the wage um, is, uh, you know, in in concert with their clerical one and two classification. And I think we've what we've seen is just a tremendous amount of interest in this time. You know, a lot of folks are obviously searching for additional employment resources, and this is one way to, to do that, and we expect that there's going to be a surge of need, potentially in the hundreds of employees. So um, any information that people would like, we can add that, um, that job recruitment announcement to the city's website and share that moving forward if that's of interest to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, I'd just like to say that, you know, I think that um, personally I know a lot of folks are looking for opportunities during this time, and so 
if there's any way we can get that um, link sent to council members or possibly get that on the website, it would be really helpful for people to know if we're looking for employment or we want to help, you know, ways that they can get involved. So very much appreciate that. I had um, a couple questions. I'm going to try to make it quick and synthesize it into one. But I was just wondering if you could speak to some of the challenges with getting shelters online. So, you know, um, we're pulling on, we're getting hotels up and running, and some folks have said, you know, we're not doing enough. And so I think it might be helpful for folks in the community if you kind of clarify the process for getting hotels online and staffing and kind of, you know, what it really takes to get something going. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and Brooke, please do chime in on this as well. So um, as soon as the shelter in place order was um, set by the public health officer, it was really clear that um, there was a recommendation for local governing bodies, both at the city and the county level, to work within the context of our current shelter environment to um, assess and resource and shelter as many folks that meet um, a certain vulnerability index as quickly as we can. Um, though that process from a public health perspective is um, focused on a few different outcomes. One is to reduce the risk of transmission within the homeless population, but of particular um, interest is to ensure those that have medical vulnerabilities or that are um, uh, exposed or diagnosed with COVID have the potential to shelter in place in a safe location um, that is, has provided medical care at some level. The overarching philosophy being that in any population in the community, um, if there is an outbreak, um, particularly amongst our most vulnerable, that could very much overwhelm our uh, local hospital and medical care system. Um, so as the state and federal government were figuring out how to best serve those with these medical vulnerabilities, um, we, Gavin Newsom, moved forward with the um, Project Room Key initiative. Those hotels are reserved for those with either COVID positive, COVID under investigation, or medically vulnerable, or over 65. Um, and that is what Project Room Key is focused on. So knowing that, the county moved forward with immediately um, engaging with hotels on ensuring that we had bed capacity, especially if we had a surge of COVID positive within the homeless community. Um, in addition to that, there has been um, direction from our local public health officer to ensure that we have enough beds to um, support folks that have other pre-existing conditions, so comorbidities with respiratory illness, um, diabetes, et cetera. And those beds are um, being operationalized as we speak. But to your point, Mayor, the, the, the potential of having a bed and um, obtaining bed space, especially at a hotel, is just one piece of the puzzle. Ensuring that those that are served through the system of care are, have medical attention, um, have opportunities for detox, quite frankly, in an isolated environment, um, medically supported detox, for instance, um, have all the resources to shelter in place, especially in isolation and quarantine. So when you think about um, those that are of us that are at liberty to go to um, take care of our essential services, um, that is um, incredibly difficult when you are unhoused. Um, and so putting all of the resources together to ensure that people have access to laundry, staff, food, water, smokes, weed, you name it, we've considered it. <laughs> the ability to bring their pets. <laughs> um, it's, it's a monumental effort and it needs to be safe and it needs to be fully, you know, all of those things need to be considered um, completely. Um, as, you, as you know, many cities jumped into a high congregate setting shelter environment, um, quite frankly, without all of that important staffing planning and resource planning um, to the detriment of the health of the individuals in the congregate settings and to staff. Um, we saw that in San Francisco and, and other locations across the, the, the U.S. 
Um, that is not something that this community wants to see. And so we are, we are taking really careful steps to make sure that um, folks that are engaged with the system are, are, are doing, <laughs> that we are making sure that their needs are met and that the safety of everybody is um, really taken at the highest level of consideration. And just to add to that, additionally, in staffing, I've been quite impressed by the candidates that we've received, but we also want to make sure that these are people who are interested in the actual position of providing care and service to this population, not simply folks who are just looking for a job. So that is an additional consideration that does take time, and we want to ensure that we have the best people possible to be serving these clients. Well, thank you all again for all of your help. And, you know, I think it really goes to show that given that we don't have, um, you know, these uh, cases of COVID popping up in our homeless population, that we've been really diligent uh, to try to ensure that those people are safe. And also, as we're moving forward, making sure that the shelters we're providing are also safe and secure. So thank you all for all your work and keep up the good work. Thank, thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you. And so I'll turn it back over to the city manager if there's any uh, further updates or reports. No, that was it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, now I'd like to call on the clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. Uh, no updates. Thank you. Um, next item on our agenda is council membership and city groups and outside agencies. This is the time for council members to report out on any actions uh, at external boards, committees, and joint power authority meetings. Additionally, if there's any work that council members have been doing related to COVID-19, this is also an opportunity for you to report out. For future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so that the council and public can be informed. So um, I'll just go down the list. And I know that for two of our council members, um, we're actually appointing them to committees today. So there's no expectation on any report outs. But um, I'll ask as well if, if those council members have anything to report out as it relates to COVID-19. So maybe I'll start with uh, council member Golder. Do you have anything to report out? Um, at this time, I don't have anything to report out. Thank you. Uh, council member Watkins. I um, unfortunately was not able to make the uh, the um, farmers market board meeting uh, the last the most recent one, but I know there's been some changes, and I think some were noted in the newspaper this morning. Um, so I advise folks to sort of track how they can access um, quality local um, vegetables and fruits right now, as well as other products uh, safely. And then um, just sort of briefly want to share that the County Office of Education has a dedicated COVID-19 website available for families and parents sort of trying to navigate how to, um, how to just adjust to homeschooling as well as other types of tips available for those who are seeking some resources in the community. I know 211 is really trying to um, be out there and beef up all their uh, resources. So if you're a nonprofit provider, I think if you can go ensure that 211 has the most current um, information about your service so that they're able to uh, make proper referral. Um, and uh, just also want to share that those, as we're starting to see more of our uh, workforce come online, uh, we know that a lot of folks are going to be needing childcare. And the uh, county office, the Child uh, Child Development Resource Center, is a free resource in the state that our county has that. You pick up the phone, you can call, and you can tell them where you live and what you're looking for, and you'll have somebody who will call you back and help you uh, find a licensed uh, quality child care provider. So I advise folks who are looking for child care to use that free resource, as, uh, as I know you'll be needing it to, in order to come back to work. Um, and so I think that's, that's about it for now to share, I'd say. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Matthews. A few things. Um, um, Donna Myers and I sit on the Metro board, and we had a board meeting recently. It's all about all about COVID, directly and indirectly. <clears throat> um, we did, um, because of the impact of uh, COVID-19, um, 
we did adopt a um, declaration of fiscal emergency, which will put us in a position for uh, future aid. Um, the uh, budget is being severely impacted. I think most of you know this ridership is, has plummeted, um, and which is an immediate cut in revenue, but also uh, tax revenue will be down, fares are down. Uh, so we did adopt uh, tentative budgets, um, operating and capital budgets, understanding that they will go through major changes as this unfolds uh, into the future. Most of this past month for the metro system was just dealing with operational changes the, the, um, because of the budget implications and um, other operational considerations um, to protect both the riders and the drivers. Um, the routes were cut back, um, distancing enforced on and limits of passengers on buses. It's really pervasive. Um, there were almost daily changes to the protocols and the regulations throughout the month. So that, that um, dealing with COVID both operationally and physically, just that's, that's what Met Metro had to do, and it's certainly not over. Um, in terms of the Revenue Committee, um, as you all know, we were um, back in the day looking at a possible increase in the TOT, um, and uh, that is clearly on hold. That will be um, coming to you at the next meeting, but I did work with, um, and so I'm, part of this is what was done in committee and partly related to committee work, uh, worked with economic development um, and the Santa Cruz County to get out a notice to the visitor industry, uh, just letting them know we anticipate that that discussion will be officially put on hold and um, re <clears throat> excuse me, reiterating our desire to work with them. They, of course, are uh, suffering um, all over the country. And uh, I will say that our economic development department is working with Visit Santa Cruz County and communicating with Visit California. They're they're national trends, and we have to deal with them at the local level. Um, and they have understood also, I would say, the um, uh, restrictions, the public public health restrictions that are being put forth, um, and have been helpful on that. Downtown Management Corporation um, has been involved in the um, project that was initiated using the Puma consultants to develop to combine the assessment districts and move forward with a property-based improvement district. Um, there is hope that that can move forward. Uh, it's in a, a state of, I would say, work capacity and uh, fiscal um, considerations that are pretty significant. Um, but I have been working uh, with downtown with the DMC, with economic development, and DTA representatives um, on that issue. Um, uh, the Library Financing Authority, because it also depends on sales tax uh, revenue, um, has had some drop in revenue in, in most recent quarter, but in, in envisions further significant drops uh, in the future, and that will affect library operations. Um, so those are the main ones that, that I sit on. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Brown, do you have any um, committees to report out on or COVID-related items to report on? Um, yeah, just uh, really quickly, I'll just say, in case anybody was wondering, I doubt you were, but the, um, at the Regional Transportation Commission, we uh, were kind of in moving ahead on uh, budget adoption for this coming fiscal year, and it probably comes as no surprise that we have very little to go on in terms of uh, what might happen with uh, the, our uh, our budget for this year, I mean, obviously, transportation projects, uh, you know, which range from, you know, work on the highway to local roads to kind of uh, looking at the, the planning process for um, alternatives uh, for the use of the rail line and, you know, kind of everything transit related, transportation related is um, the budget is quite up in the air. We rely on gas tax and sales tax as major. Uh, portion of that budget. So we, um, I'll just say, we decided to move forward with what we had and, and on the budget and kind of uh, 
think about reevaluating that uh, in the months to come. Um, it was a really daunting conversation. And part, that's part of the reason I want to mention it. It was just really, really um, daunting to think about um, all of the ways that these impacts are going to be seen um, kind of longer term and the work that we're going to have to do to um, to move forward in these new uh, under these new conditions. Uh, so that was uh, one of my the committees the cannabis committee met. We actually uh, reviewed and uh, we'll be coming to the council uh, some uh, program changes that will um, kind of respond to the industry's concerns, the cannabis industry concerns, but also maintain uh, the goals that we put forward when we initially um, adopted the, um, the guidelines and uh, licensing requirements. So um, that will be coming, I think, the second meeting in May. And uh, I think, oh, I just wanted to give one other update on, so on age-friendly communities because I've been talking about this um, and saying coming soon for quite a while now. I wanted to report that at our last meeting last week, uh, we had a discussion about the role of local governments vis-a-vis -vis the county. Um, and so that is kind of not on hold, but you know we're, we're working through some issues and I'll, I'll send a more uh, detailed written update about that and, and how I think we should proceed um, in the future. And I think that's all for now. Thank you. Thanks. Councilmember Byers, do you have any, or obviously you're not on any committees yet because I'm going to put you on those today, um, but do you have anything to report out that might be, you know, COVID related that you've been talking with community members about? Oh, and you're, you're muted, by the way. But, uh, uh, no, other than I'm really doing a lot of work with Housing Matters. I've been on that board for years and it is a, as we all know, a most difficult time, but um, it, uh, the staff, you know, the whole idea is support the staff because they are on the front line. And anyway, we had a board meeting and that was really what we're trying to do as a board member. And uh, of course, Phil runs the day-to-day -day operation, but no, that's all. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Myers, do you have anything to report out on? Um, I think Council Member Matthews covered my two main committees, the uh, Downtown Management um, Corporation that I sit on the board and um, Metro. Um, the CALS Working Group uh, has not convened. I believe we're going to be convening sometime next month. Um, so we'll be looking to report out some of the, um, act, some of the successes on uh, water quality with regards to our beach, which we hope someday people can come back to in a healthy way. And um, also just uh, it kind of external or other activities, um, I have been participating with the mayor and Supervisor Coonerty and Martine Bernal in regular calls with um, our state and federally elected uh, uh, leaders, including um, Congressman Panetta and uh, Assemblymember Stone specifically. Uh, we continue also to do outreach with our business sector through various um, conference calls, calling uh, or uh, collecting folks together to find out um, a little more about specific impacts. Um, we've been in touch with our community, Santa Cruz uh, County Community Foundation Executive Director, um, ass assessing impacts to nonprofits. So just a lot of work with trying to um, understand the impacts to the community and try to get people connected and um, looking forward to uh, developing more strategies for uh, recovery um, as we move forward through this. So those, that's my report. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll just echo that uh, Vice Mayor Myers and myself have been working really closely uh, with our other elected officials and we've been really working closely with many folks in our community, uh, the different sectors to ensure that people have the resources that they need and we hear their concerns and that we're able to communicate those concerns uh, with our state and local representatives or state and federal representatives. Um, as far as uh, committees and commissions, I'd say the majority of the committees that I stand on, uh, a lot of those meetings got canceled. And so um, just given the staff time and or um, the fact that at the beginning of the month, everything kind of came to a grinding halt. 
So some of those meetings, like uh, the Association of Modern Bay Area Governments and LASCO, uh, it sounds like those meetings are going to start um, ramping up again in the near future. I will, however, report out that the uh, Monterey Bay Community Power met on April 13th, and the policy board uh, adopted a resolution to defer Monterey Bay Community Power charges by 50% in May and June for all customers to assist in the, with the financial burden that COVID-19 has inflicted on Central Coast communities, residents, and businesses. So, um, yeah, so those charges are going to be cut in half for the months of May and June to help customers. And that was the unanimous vote. Uh, in addition to that, um, just to reflect on some other meetings, um, I was able to meet with the Mexican consulate and share information with them about how we're supporting uh, immigrant communities and um, throughout the COVID-19 process. Um, Vice Mayor and myself also met with uh, representatives from the California Apartment Association, the California, uh, the Santa Cruz County Realtors, Main Street Realtors, to really get a sense of what was happening with the housing market and the rental communities. Um, overall, what was expressed was that uh, although tenants struggled a lot to pay their rent in April, uh, most of the um, most of these associations reported out that about 90% of uh, tenant, residential tenants were able to pay their rent, but folks were concerned about what would be happening as we move into May and we start to see that you know, people haven't been working. Um, the stimulus checks were something that came through in April, but we're not expecting in May. And so many folks are concerned with moving forward how residential tenants would be able to pay their rents. Uh, where there was a lot of concern was with commercial tenants um, everyone reported out that pretty much only uh, a very small percentage of commercial businesses were able to pay their rents during the month of April. And so moving forward, that is a growing concern. Uh, the California Apartment Association, uh, we, as we continue to discuss you know, what um, options could be done for tenants, and I'll also mention that I did meet with some tenant advocates before this meeting to kind of get a sense of what tenants wanted to um, you know, share during this meeting. And uh, the California Apartment Association expressed that they're supporting a bill that would provide up to 80% of monthly rent that a tenant would owe for up to three months, provided that the landlords who participate in that pr program would agree to not increase rent um, on the unit for the specified period. They would not charge late fees for part of the uh, for past due rent paid for by the program, and that they would not pursue any remaining rent owed for the month that were covered by the program. And so um, that was a meeting that was held with, as I mentioned before, Vice Mayor Myers and myself, um, and we reached out to uh, Council Member Brown, who's part of the Affordable Housing Committee, and we're gonna be uh, reviewing the language of that as it's developed so that we can um, see how it would affect our community, what other components of that bill um, are, are there, and uh, understand whether or not we will be writing a letter of support. And so that may be something that we'll be, we will be bringing to council after we have an opportunity to review that bill. Um, in addition to that, um, we've, I've been on weekly calls with the League of California Cities, and um, we've been having weekly meetings with the county health officer, the health service agency director, uh, the county administrative officer, the sheriff, and the mayors from the four cities so that we're able to uh, kind of express um, how our communities are being impacted individually and understand what um, what decisions are being made and, and how COVID-19 is impacting the county. And so um, I've been sending updates to council members, but I'm going to be sending weekly updates either in the form of um, a PDF or a webinar to share this information with the community. And I'd just like to let folks know that we're preparing um, a flyer, but we are anticipating this Friday that I'll be leading a webinar at 4 p.m. just to provide the community with some updates on, um, on how we're progressing over time and give the community an additional opportunity to ask questions on how we're responding to COVID-19. And that's all I wanted to report out. Mayor, are you going to share, if I may, um, are you going to share on the website how people can access your webinar for yeah. Friday? Yeah. Um, Okay, we're we're um, developing the materials. We're also working on the materials as we speak, and um, we're hoping to have that link up. In the and there's Ralph, actually. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so Ralph.
wrapping up um, the final details to that right now. It is scheduled for Friday at 4 p.m. Um, we are transitioning the um, licenses uh, for webinars from one staff member to another, and we didn't want to do that before the council meeting and mess the settings up for this meeting. So um, immediately after this meeting, we'll have the uh, directions available for the, uh, the community, and um, we'll be sharing it out there. Um, we are limited to 500, so hopefully you know, we do reach that max. Um, but um, if we do reach that max, um, it, it will be recorded and will be available to the public um, uh, after the meeting. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're running a little, well, we're running behind schedule, but um, hopefully we'll be able to catch up here soon. And so moving on, um, we'll move on to our consent agenda. First item up on the, is the consent agenda is items numbers four through 14. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items number four and 14. Instructions are on, should be on your screen, and please remember to mute uh, your streaming device. Press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying that you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who would like to pull any items on consent agenda? Okay. Hearing none. Oh, uh, uh, Mayor, I, I I just wanted to speak to item number six. Sure. Um, I guess this will be a, a, a good time for you to speak for that. Okay. Thanks. Um, I didn't want to pull it, but I just really wanted to highlight it in that uh, for those who weren't uh, on the council or following this, um, this is for the interest of those who are working. Hang on just a sec. I'm trying to transition my um, to, on, to the online version. So this is the resolution urging the California state legislator and the governor to immediately overturn SB 872, which uh, took place in 2008. And that banned local government from taxing sugar uh, sweetened beverages. And so I just really wanna thank you, Mayor, as well as Council Member Matthews for co-signing this item. We're asking our uh, legislators to overturn this. We kind of are a unique, I'd say, because the city of Santa Cruz had actually made the decision to place this item, this, to, to place this measure on our ballot. And uh, within that time frame, that the state took action, which then led us as a council to have to rescind that decision, unfortunately. And just really wanted to highlight that other communities that have passed these types of uh, measures have used the funds to support those who are experiencing food inequities and food uh, hunger at this time. And also uh, an additional element that, uh, thank you Councilman Matthews for pointing out, is sugar-sweetened beverages contribute to a lot of the underlying health uh, impacts that we're seeing a uh, uh, having a, ho a more horrible response to the COVID uh, crisis. So um, just sort of wanted to highlight that and, and thank the, the, the council hopefully in advance for uh, wanting to move forward with this resolution. Right. And I'd just like to say as well, thank you, uh, Council Member Watkins for bringing this forward. I think it's really important that, you know, local jurisdictions have control over, you know, things like um, sugar sweetened beverages and you know whether or not we, we, we want to tax those items um, because we should be in control of the health of our community. So I want to thank you for bringing that item forward as well. Uh, we have Count Vice Mayor Myers and then Council Member Brown. We, uh, Mayor, did I hear that no one had pulled other, any other items? I was just uh, gonna offer a motion to, um, to um, pass it, you know, to uh, approve the consent agenda. Prior to approving, we're gonna open up to public comment, um, but I'll come back to you uh, after public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Council Mem Member Watkins' statements and, and Mayor Cummings about this item. Thank you for bringing it forward. Um, just to say, uh, we were, not only are we unique in that we had voted to place this on the ballot, but literally at the same time, maybe like within a few minutes <laughs> of each other, we cast that vote while the uh, sugar, sugary beverage industry was, uh, had succeeded in getting the legislature to adopt this. Um, so they put a tremendous amount of pressure uh, on the state uh, legislature. And, um, you know, I think that uh, it's 
I'm, I'm really glad to see that we're doing this to kind of push back and, uh, um, you know, I think it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out at the state, but I'm hopeful that we'll get there. Thanks. Thank you for those comments. So at this moment, I will turn it over to the members of the public. Uh, this is the time for comment on all the items that are on our consent agenda. So at this time, uh, if you could press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Uh, we will then acknowledge you so that you can comment on the items on our consent agenda. So I'll give us a few, give us a little bit of time to see if people want to um, call in. All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Vice Mayor Myers. I'll move to uh, approve the consent agenda. Oh, I'll second. <laughs> a motion by uh, Councilmember Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by uh, Councilmember Watkins. And I'd like to ask the clerk to please call a uh, roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Here. Uh, Yes, okay. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Next up on our agenda is public hearing, item number 15. Um, this is the HUD 2020-2021 Action Plan and the 2020-2025 Consolidation Plan. Um, doesn't look like there's a presentation on this item, and that's because it will be postponed until uh, May 12th. And so we will revisit that item uh, on, our, on our May 12th agenda. Next on our agenda is general business. Uh, we begin this afternoon with agenda item number 16. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. If you're interested in commenting on uh, item number 16, which is to interest for publication and ordinance amending sections 3.08.030 and 3.08.100 of and adding section 3.08091 to the Santa Cruz Municipal Code to establish regulations for the use, award, and evaluation of best value project delivery methods for construction projects. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hands uh, after the questions have been made from council. Uh, and when it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will be set to two minutes. And so I'll turn this over to Kevin Crossley, senior uh, professional engineer, and Melissa Capping, management analyst. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Cummings, council members. This is Rosemary Menard. I'm gonna just do a really quick introduction and then uh, Kevin is going to give you a brief presentation. The council took action in October last year to put a, a charter amendment item on the agenda to allow for what's called best value um, uh, procurement of contractual and design services for capital projects. And that um, item was on the March 3rd election ballot and it passed with an 81% vote. So uh, one of the things that the, the measure directed us to do was in the event that it was passed to bring back the implementing language and ordinance to the council for your action. So this is the presentation to bring that information forward. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin Crossley for, his, uh, for the brief presentation.
I, I suspect what's going on is we're working on trying to figure out how to get the presentation to advance <clears throat> there in moments. Just go into speaker mode, Kevin, or a presentation mode. Uh, Bonnie, can you help um, to give direction about how to get the presentation to advance? See me? Yeah. Uh, Bonnie, why don't we take a quick break while we um, try to figure out these technical difficulties? I couldn't get to my unmute button because she's sharing the screen. It, if you, can you go to the slideshow and then from beginning? Kevin on here, but we can't hear him. Kevin, are you unmuted? Here we go. Maybe. Kevin, are you unmuted? Sorry. Okay. Yes. This is Laura. Go into uh, the top of the PowerPoint, go to slideshow. Up at, up at this uh, part, Kevin, right here. The slideshow. And then click on setup slideshow. Kevin, can you hear Laura? He's showing us unmuted. He's, I, his volume is a different issue. He's called in as an attendee, not as a panelist. Oh. So that's a problem. Okay, I think I can do that. No, I don't see him as an attendee. I have him as a panelist. He is a panelist. Um, do, do you want, Melissa? Should be in. I apologize. Do you want me to try to do that? Yes, please. Okay, um, can someone make me the presenter? That, that's Melissa, right? Oh, yes, this is Melissa. So I got an error saying that Kevin has to stop his screen share if, if he wants me to start doing it. One of those things we didn't practice, right? <laughs> hey, Rose, Mary, are you gonna be giving the presentation? Like speaking? Um, let Melissa can give it. Okay, because if, if somebody Melissa, wants, to, if somebody wants to put it in the M drive, I can share it from Chambers. Can you see my screen now? I, it should be on screen share now. You can see the presentation. Yes. You can? Okay. Yeah. Did it change? Yeah. Can you see the project delivery methods now? Okay. Um, well, thank you for your patience while we work this out. I appreciate it. Um, so when we talk about best value project delivery methods, this is kind of um, a good visual that shows you how the contracts work. Um, the traditional contract, the owner would be the city, and we contract um, separately with the designer and a contractor. You can kind of see that that gap in the bottom of that traditional circle where there's not a contractual relationship between the designer and contractor. So when we're talking about best value project delivery methods, we're talking about contracts where the um, people are, um, are contracted together um, in ways where they work together. Um, so some examples of those are the construction manager at risk uh, design build contracts are examples of those. Um, so let's move on. So some of the uh, benefits of best value. Um, so these are the, the benefits that are, and, um, that we've experienced or 
agencies have experienced throughout California. You're talking about reduced project costs, expedited schedules, um, and then you have the innovative solutions and also um, improved quality and owner satisfaction with the projects overall. So that's why they're called best value. Um, so just to, to kind of explain why we're doing this now instead of years ago, um, well, right now we have several large technically complex projects on the near horizon. Um, we're looking at innovative solutions that, that accomplish these projects. We're um, looking to get some real-time information so we can make better decisions. And these uh, collaborative contract relationships will help us to better co coordinate efforts on these really complex projects. Um, so I want to put um, in the horizon, in the near horizon, in June 2020, we're actually going to be coming back to you to talk about um, our first progressive design build contract that we would like to seek your approval on. It's for a capital major investment plan for a water treatment plant. So that's exciting for us. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about why we did Measure W, which Rosemary uh, referred to at the beginning of the introduction of this, and that is because California Public Contract Code does allow cities to do best value contracting, but it specifically allows projects that are only over a million dollars for building or buildings. And so it specifically excludes street projects and water infrastructure projects. So Measure W was written to give us the flexibility to use these best value procurement methods for any project size and scope. Um, let's see, so this is what Measure W looked like. You can see um, the new language in here specifically says that we will be establishing by ordinance the regulations for the award use and evaluation of these contracts. So that is why we're here. We um, created that ordinance for the review, um, and here are some of the highlights. Basically, uh, council approval prior to using best value. So we will be coming um, to you prior to or concurrent with the award of the contract to seek your approval on using this type of contracting. Um, now, we are going to be using a competitive proposal process to um, evaluate and award these contracts. So we'll still be using competitive process out there. And we're using the competitive, the existing competitive process that's already outlined in the Muni code. So we're not creating anything um, crazy and new. We're going to be using our existing processes. Um, one thing we did in this year is we defined eligibility um, a little bit better with design build teams. Sometimes those team members can have worked on previous projects for the city, so we wanted to clarify how and when people that have been working on projects before, how they can work with us on future design build projects. That's kind of like some of the, the highlights of the ordinance. Um, and then some of the existing things that we care about as a city, um, all those things will be included in these new best value contracts. Um, we'll still be including the language in there about the apprentice and local hire requirements. We will still be using prevailing wage requirements. Um, these types of contracting are accepted by all the state and federal grant and loan funding entities. So we're not doing anything that is new and crazy. Um, they all accept this type of contracting. And you can do um, this type of contracting with project labor agreements. Um, so let's open it up for questions. Great. Thank you for that presentation. I'll uh, bring it back to council. Is there any council member who has any questions on this item at this time? All right. Seeing none. Um, I will open it up to the public for public comment. Um, so, uh, at this point in time, for the public, there should be a list of numbers, phone numbers you can call in on on your screen. 
Um, now is the time to call in, and if you'd like to raise your hand, please press star nine on your phone. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will be set to two minutes. Seeing that there are no members of the public who are calling in on this item, I'll bring it back to for action and deliberation. And uh, I see Councilmember Matthews' hand is up. Thank you, Will. Um, yes, I'm live. Thank you, Rosemary, for bringing this to us <laughs> back in the fall. And um, uh, the timing is obvious. It's so important. Look what we approved on our consent agenda, a couple of major public works projects, and I think five water project. So obviously this uh, promises to hold really great benefits for us going into the future. So thank you. It's, it's one of those things that was just spectacularly unsexy <laughs> going into the election. We'll just yeah. want death value. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, obviously it means a lot. It has, um, uh, it has broad support uh, out in the community. Uh, passing with 81% is amazing. People tell us, you know, 20% of people will vote no on anything. So that, that's about as close as you get to unanimous. Anyway, um, thank you for all the work, that, the technical work that went into it. It'll pay off. So uh, with that, I'll just go ahead and move um, uh, the first meeting. I'll second the motion. I'll second that. We have a motion made by uh, Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Watkins, and then uh, Vice Mayor Myers, I saw you had your hand up. No, I, I was going to second it, but I'll, I'll bring it back down. Okay. Good Rochambeau. <laughs> <laughs> All right, given that um, I'm running off time, I'll hold my comments with you. So I'll set the minute for bringing this forward uh, as expressed by Councilmember Matthews. And so um, if there's no further comment at this time, I'll turn it over to the clerk to do a roll call vote on the item. Councilmember Byers. You're muted, Gavin. Yes. Matthews. Aye. Brown. Aye. Boulder. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers. Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you for your support. Appreciate it. And uh, Justin, I'd just like to add to, I recognize you, Mary, but really it was so many people in your department. I know you had the great staff doing really good work on this. So that compliments go to all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this. extending the emergency declaration in connection with COVID-19 pandemic by 60 days and ratifying hey, confirming uh, the Mayor Cummings, sorry. Is there a way we could take a quick break? Sure. Okay. Yeah, why don't we take a, a five minute break um, and then we'll, we'll come back at uh, 4.15. Thank you. Bonnie, can you?
I think we're good. You're muted, Justin. I was just saying, I'm not sure what happened with Catherine. I'm, she's not back on, and I'm wondering if she might be having some trouble. Justin, you're muted again. Justin, you're muted. I was just going to see if we can check people's audio real quick. Donna, can you just can check your audio? Can you hear me? Yep. Renee? Can you hear me? Yep. Sandy? Yeah. Can you try that again? Sandy, you sounded. Can you hear, can you hear me? Not really. I'm pretty muffled. Worse than before. Oh, no. Uh, now. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. No. I will. I will try to use the phone. Oh, you just you just got better. Oh, okay. Oh. It's my internet connection. Maybe try using your phone because it, it it like comes in and out. <laughs> I'll um, I'll do that. If I disappear for a sec, I'll be back. Okay. Uh, Catherine, can we check your audio? Yeah. Can you hear me? Clear. Martine? Uh, yes, Hi. I'm here. Oh, the other Martine. Oh, Martine. Oh, 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 Justin, this is Laura. I called in via my daughter's cell phone as a participant, and it worked. So I think okay. it's working on the participant side. Okay, great. I think what we'll do um, when we get to oral communications is if we can allow people to speak maybe on um, consent and then the any item on consent and then the items, um, yeah, so an item number 16, and then if no one wants to speak on that, we can then move into oral communications, and that way people can have an opportunity to weigh in on those if they want to. And Mayor, it would be helpful if they would specify if they're speaking on a specific item as opposed to oral communication. Okay, so maybe what we could do is start with if they want to speak to any item on oral communication and identify that item, then we move on to item 16, and then we move on to oral communications. Does that sound like it would work? 
for me or? <laughs> for me. All right. So now I think, Sandy, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. And your, your video is off too for some reason. But right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, great. Um, okay, I think we're ready to keep going. Just let me know, Bonnie. I think we're good. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to um, we have to let the public know we had some technical difficulties. Um, apparently, the call in numbers had requested a password, and folks weren't able to um, comment on earlier items. And so what we'll do is before, after we get through uh, all of our general business, prior to oral communications, we will uh, allow members of the public who wanted to com who wanted to comment on anything on consent to um, identify the item on the consent agenda should they wish to comment on it. Um, they'll have two minutes to comment on that item. Additionally, if there's members of the public who wanted to comment on item number 16, we'll provide time for members of the public to comment on that item, and then we will um, can, we will continue and move forward with oral communications. So well, we apologize for the technical difficulties, um, but we hope that if you still would like to weigh in on items that have been heard earlier in the day, that you would um, have the time to express yourself uh, prior to oral communications. So with that, uh, we'll move on to our next item, general item of business, item number 17. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council, who will then take public comment and then return to council for action and deliberation. And item number 17, so members of the public are aware, is a resolution extending the emergency declaration in connection with COVID-19 pandemic by 60 days and ratifying and confirming the Director of Emergency Services Executive Orders um, NOS 2020-1 through 2020-6. And uh, I'll turn it over to our City Attorney, Tony Condotti, for the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. Uh, good afternoon, and good afternoon, members of the City Council and, and uh, staff and public who are present. This afternoon, um, the item before you is a resolution extending the declaration of emergency in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic and ratifying a series of executive orders issued by the city manager acting in his capacity as director of emergency services uh, in connection with the same topic. Um, as you will recall, the council did adopt its initial a declaration of a local health emergency on March 10th. Uh, this is a follow-up to a statewide declaration of emergency issued by Governor Newsom on March 4th, and uh, a, a declaration of a countywide uh, health emergency by uh, County Health Officer Dale Newell on March 6th. Um, under the California law, when the council adopts an emergency declaration of this sort, it's only temporary in nature. And so uh, what the law requires is that, um, that as soon as the emergency uh, situation has been resolved, that the council rescind the emergency declaration. And in any event, if it does not do so, uh, then it's required to take up the item again uh, within 60 days of the initial declaration or the uh, emergency declaration will expire uh, within that 60-day period. Now, what the emergency declaration, other than just to make the public aware of a crisis situation, what it does is uh, a number of things. First, um, it triggers a, uh, a requirement for public agencies in the area to cooperate and provide mutual aid and assistance in uh, dealing with the emergency. You might uh, have seen information about city staff being deployed at, at county health uh, homeless uh, facilities and whatnot, and that is pursuant to the declaration of emergency. Um, 
uh, different agencies that require assistance are able to reach out and uh, either provide uh, or receive assistance from their uh, other local agencies. Uh, the declaration also uh, gives the city the opportunity to uh, seek and obtain reimbursement for the cost of uh, responding to the emergency declaration, either through the state of California when there's a statewide <coughs> emergency or through the Federal Emergency Management Agency for a national emergency. And so this declaration is one of the things that we need to do in order to potentially qualify for reimbursement of some of the expenditures that the city's incurring uh, responding to this crisis. And the third thing that the emergency declaration does is it empowers the city manager acting as your designated emergency services director to uh, to summarily abate any emergency or nuisance conditions that exist uh, that are impacted by the uh, emergency and to issue rules and regulations on matters that are reasonably related to the protection of life and property as affected by the emergency. And so um, one of the things that we've all seen and, and spent time reading and trying to understand and digest are the series of public health officer orders that have been issued by uh, the county public health officer. And, and under our system, um, the county public health officer also serves as the public health officer for the city. But unlike the unincorporated areas of the county where the sheriff's department in cooperation with the health officer is enforcing those uh, declarations and those uh, orders, um, the city is called upon to uh, enforce the health officers, uh, shelter in place orders and other uh, emergency orders that are issued in connection with the, the crisis. And so working with the police department and the, the director of emergency services, um, several actions have been undertaken uh, to implement the emergency. And the first was in uh, shortly after the declaration of emergency was an order number 2020-01 that ordered a summary nuisance abatement of a large unsanctioned encampment adjacent to the uh, post office uh, with uh, offer of temporary alternative shelter to the occupants. And this was done in observation of a number of factors that um, were directly uh, affected by the shelter in place order, including proximity, uh, public gatherings, um, safe distancing requirements, and that sort of thing. The second order was ordering summary, uh, summary nuisance abatement of a food distribution service and sort of a rally or social gathering at the city's town clock at North Pacific Avenue on Water Street. And the, and the um, city manager issued this directive to provide an alternative uh, means of providing uh, uh, food services of that sort that respect the shelter in place and social distancing requirements. Um, we heard about that from uh, Ms. O'Hara earlier this afternoon. Uh, the third was an order, uh, was ordering a temporary suspension of personnel rules while the emergency uh, regula uh, declarations remain in effect. And this wasn't really just a wholesale suspension of personnel rules, but it really more related to the ability to make some emergency personnel uh, decisions to, uh, to bring on board staff on a shortened basis to respond to the emergency situation. Uh, the um, fourth was establishing basic, basic safety rules and permit requirements for uh, individuals and organizations engaging in outdoor food service operations. And uh, the intent was to set up parameters to ensure that the food service operations, which are which are uh, very important to the homeless population in Santa Cruz, but are also done in a way that is safe and sanitary. Uh, the fifth is ordering all persons in the city of Santa Cruz to adhere to all lawful orders from the county and the state of California relating to COVID-19. And this is really intended to give the city staff the enforcement tools necessary to ensure that these very important uh, safety rules are are implemented throughout the community in a way that protects uh, public health and safety and reduces the risk of spread of the COVID-19 uh, virus. And the last was uh, number 2020-06, establishing a temporary limit of 15% on commissions charged by 
third-party food delivery companies to support Santa Cruz restaurants during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I've heard questions about what um, missions by food delivery services has to do with um, responding to a, a public health emergency. But um, if you compare some of the actions that have been taken by the federal government and the state government with respect to court deadlines, with respect to pr providing financial relief to businesses, uh, to, to various um, actions that have been taken, they're not all specifically related to the spread of COVID-19. They're also uh, intended to address some of the economic uh, fallout of uh, this crisis and of the, of the response to it. And so the resolution which is before you would merely ratify the actions that have been taken. It's not uh, the council is not taking the specific action. It's merely just ratifying these actions that have already been taken by the uh, director of emergency services and extending the declaration of emergency for 60 days or until the council decides to uh, declare an end to the emergency. My guess, uh, just given everything that we know, is that we'll be back in front of you with a modified uh, resolution to further extend the declaration of emergency in 60 days, but hopefully on less um, uh, stringent uh, terms in terms of the sheltering in place orders and whatnot. And I'm happy to respond to any questions or comments from council members. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Attorney Kandati. Are there any questions uh, from council members at this time on the item that's before us? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, if, you're, if members of the public are interested in commenting on item number 16, uh, which is, oops, sorry, my apologies, item number 17, which is a resolution extending the emergency declaration in conjunction with um, COVID-19. Um, there, there should be numbers on your screen that you can call in on. Um, after you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and your timer will be set to two minutes. We have a number of callers on the line and so um, I'm going to begin unmuting folks now. So, mm, no. How far around? Yeah, I just have a quick question if I could before you do that. Um, thank you, Tony, for the uh, clear overview of the uh, recommendation that's being made today. I do have, uh, so I have two questions. One, uh, I'm just wondering, because we've received a lot of, obviously, comment in all different, uh, from all different perspectives about how to proceed here. So I just want to ask you if you could just clarify, um, in terms of what we're being asked to do today, this is not, is, is this, is there anything that's changing in terms of the, um, the, the authority of the emergency services manager um, in this in this uh, emergency declaration versus the the one that we had in effect. Is there anything that's changing? Because I think there's been some confusion in the community about um, us extending our um, you know extending our authority or the city manager's office authority in some way. So just wanted to ask you to comment on that. No, the authority of the uh, city manager as the emergency mm -hmm. services director is, um, is, is embedded in the city's municipal code. The declaration of the emergency does give the city manager tools that would not be available in the absence of such an emergency. Uh, but they have to be narrowly uh, uh, focused on addressing some of the uh, conditions in, of the emergency. They cannot be on a totally unrelated topics uh, and so uh, and and so what this is really doing is just um, following the requirements of the code to bring these emergency declarations to the attention of the council for comment and for for um, and, the, and the code specifically says for confirmation but it's really just to acknowledge that these actions have been taken and I suppose it would be 
possible for the council to direct the, um, the, the emergency services director to modify or rescind one or more of these. Um, but it's really just to, to make sure that there's a public process of reviewing and, um, and um, uh, communicating the, these orders. So just to just one just to clarify to make sure it's clear the so that, because there's two parts there's the um, you know uh, kind of post facto authorization of the um, actions that have been taken but the extension of the order is not is it providing additional tools or additional yeah okay that's what I thought I just wanted to make no. sure that was clear the real critical. The real critical thing here, frankly, is that um, the agency, that the city is, is expending considerable resources responding to this crisis, and we're really documenting those carefully and keeping track of them. And I, I see the fire chief is, is um, a participant in this meeting, and um, having that emergency declaration place is, in place is one of the necessary aspects that we need in order to ensure the maximum extent possible that we have the opportunity to seek reimbursement for these costs. So that's the primary emphasis. But again, as the code indicates, if the emergency services director issues uh, emergency rules or regulations, then the code requires that they be presented to the uh, council for confirmation at the earliest practicable opportunity. Thank you. Manager who has the oh, okay, I was just going to add that it merely extends the time frame. It doesn't really change any of the authorities or anything around it. It's just the time frame. It's funny also, just for clarification for the public, is the items that have been um, the, the, um, the executive orders, those have already taken, I just wanted to be clear to the public, and maybe you can confirm this, but those have already took place. And so, um, we're not taking new actions at this time. These are all actions that have previously taken place, and all we're doing currently is ratifying and confirming the actions that have been taking place in the past. That is exactly right. Thank you. All right. Okay, uh, are there any other questions or comments from members of the council? Seeing none, I'll uh, turn it over to the public uh, for public comment. With the exception of Robert Norris from Huff, uh, members of the public will have two minutes uh, to uh, speak on this item. And as I mentioned before, the numbers on your screen, please dial one of those. If a uh, number is busy, please try, try the next number so that you can call in. And press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. And as I mentioned before, with the exception of Robert Norris from Huff, uh, you will have two minutes to speak on this item. And, okay, um, 3173, you are on the line. Yes, thank you. This is Peter Goblin calling in, and I uh, urge you to not ratify or confirm uh, orders one, two, and four. Uh, and please, uh, take your duty seriously. You're not here to rubber stamp the city manager's uh, orders. You're here as our elected representatives to make sure that he's doing what he's doing is proper and legal and authorized. And those orders are not authorized for a simple reason. They rely entirely on his statements that he has the authority to conduct a summary nuisance abatement under Municipal Code 2.20.080. That's his authority for one, two, and four. 2.20.080 does not allow them to do this. It refers only to abatements of buildings that are damaged. This came out of the earthquake. The section reads, whenever in the judgment of the director, it appears that a public nuisance exists in, on, or near any building, he may summarily order that the building be vacated, barricaded, repaired, or demolished. That's it. That's the only kind of summary nuisance abatement he can uh, order, and uh, it's very important because this summary means that he doesn't have to get a court to order it, which is normally the process. 
but please look at that carefully. You can pull it up on your screens. Look at the statute that he relies on for his authority. The authority is not there. Uh, and even if you think he has some other authority, but he relied on that one, if he relied on something else, if you're relying on something else, I still urge you not to confirm or ratify those three orders as a message to the city attorney and the city manager to be more open and transparent and not to suggest that he has the powers under the statute, which he does not have. It's crucial because he's given so much wide power authority under the statute. It really has to be reined in by you, our elected representative. Thank you. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Hey, I congratulate the city manager for fine work, and I uh, generally endorse this agenda item. Uh, these orders, an extended emergency, uh, seems very reasonable, uh, but missing on the agenda are specific actions to restart even one iota of the economy and, a, and admission that it's time to change policy course based on new information on risk fatality that comes out every day. I don't think we should just be a puppet for the county health uh, um, authority. Uh, you, there might be things that you know are special to Santa Cruz, and I, I hope we can uh, uh, allow for that. And I'm so worried about the item number five there. But anyway, this current government emergency economic annihilation is based on let's review ignorant opinions that first said no big deal, then millions are going to die based on nothing except pure fear of the unknown. Later they said 20, 240,000 are going to die. COVID's ten times more deadly than the flu, and increasingly all we find is that's falsehood. The plan is no one ever should get infected at any cost, isolation and quarantine until a vaccine is available, turn the economy on and off based on health care capacity. This is madness going forward and may become the biggest policy mistake in my lifetime, including Vietnam and Iraq. This is a health emergency, but only for the minority of the vulnerable. 97% of the COVID hospital admissions are for 50-year-olds and older, and critical cases generally have underlying core morbidity conditions. We are not New York City or Italy. Our median age is 29, not 36, like over the hill. We are healthier, and the 18 patients, the mere 18 patients and two deaths in the county prove it. It's not that we shelter better. We cannot afford the economic on-off switch. The government cannot admit its blanket policy needs a local adjustment, and there are not essential workers and not essential. There are also at-risk workers, unhealthy over 50, and not at risk, healthy under 50, who statistically won't find this under any conditions any worse than the flu of 2017. Robert Norris of Huff. Um, I, I think you, if you are going to pass this, and I tend to agree with Peter Gelbloom earlier, that, you know, can you hear me? I pause you for one sec. I just want to make sure that, um, given that it's Robert Norris from Huff, that we make sure that he has the four minutes that he requires. I got it. Okay. All right, Robert, you can continue. Thank you. Um, I think we need to take seriously what we heard about the city manager's overreaching authority. If you're going to be passing this resolution, narrow it to 30 days. If you, I mean, you, one of the last speakers just expressed his concern that things are not as serious as some think they are. Whether that's true or not, it's serious for folks outside. And the authority that is expanded, and it is expanded, contrary to what the city attorney and the city manager has said, because of item 18, which you haven't come up to yet, which massively deputizes scores and scores of city employees to act as police officers, sort of mini cops. Now, the California Emergency Services Act, expiring May 9th, authorizes the city to do a number of things to more effectively respond to COVID-19. So what was the first order that the acting all-powerful city manager did? Did he place porta-potties next to existing encampments to provide safer, more sanitary conditions for that vulnerable population? No, he's repeatedly refused to do this and thwarted private attempts to do so in the past. Admittedly, some have now been placed, and I thank you for that. I thank the city for doing that. However, for a long time last year, that remained undone and maybe set the stage for where we are now. Because you can't tell if asymptomatic people are spreading this or not. 
even if you have no COVID positive folks uh, in, the, in the homeless population as is claimed. Now the COVID-19 crisis um, also uh, involves CDC recommendations, which the city manager has violated, that homeless be allowed, indeed encouraged, to shelter in place by disrupting, ejecting, and forcing the movement, that was Bernal's action through the police, of a relatively safe encampment on the sidewalk next to the post office, relocating them to a fenced off area without food, water, or safe distancing. That was Bernal's first order, 2020-01. His second order was to block survival food and services distribution center, set up at the town clock by Food Not Bombs, the homeless union and Huff to provide the 24-hour services that Bernal chose not to open. Some homeless people slept nearby, but all these areas have been fenced off at the town clock, the post office, Scope Park, and elsewhere again by the in order, which essentially removed an accessible site. His fourth order was again directed at Food Not Bombs, which he has apparently a particular uh, uh, passion for getting rid of, uh, to force it away from its more accessible location at the town clock, driven to uh, essentially the soggy, unsound ground at San Lorenzo Benchlands. Refusing to risk the health of its clients, Food Not Bombs moved without a permit, without permission, to its location at Laurel and Front Streets, where it now serves scores of people from 1 to 6 p.m. daily using safe distancing and sanitary equipment protections. His order creates new regulations to punish Food Not Bombs. His effective assistance to those outside has embarrassed the city, unwilling to provide the necessary motel rooms that San Francisco, Los Angeles, Orange County, and at least 14 other counties, according to Governor Newsom, have opened up for the vulnerable. Instead, Bernal and this council continue to fund and facilitate congregate shelters that heighten the risk of COVID-19 transmission while insisting that housed folks shut themselves indoors on penalty of $1,000 fine. We need a directive to the city manager, the police chief, that, and his newly designated mini-cops that they follow the CDC guidelines for A, ending the sweeps against the B, cease interfering with essential life-sustaining activity by homeless advocates, and of course, I would urge you to add that to any passage of this. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hello, good afternoon. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, you know, I wanted to comment on what the woman talked about in the 5, 10, 30 years and where Santa Cruz was going, but I couldn't. I wanted to comment about what Andy Mills said, but I couldn't. But the only thing I can say right now is that this whole thing is madness. And we're, we're facing 11 different mass extinctions with the Earth's biosphere, and that's never talked about with the city of Santa Cruz, like it's, uh, like it's its own biosphere. So I just feel really kind of frustrated that it, what, I, what I witness is madness. But on a different note, before I leave, this might be madness as well, but somebody gave me a very nice compliment today. They said, you channel God's voice. So my name is James Ewing Whitman, and I write a lot of stuff on Facebook. No, oh, it's positive, but obviously that might have been. So thank you very much for your time. And I'm looking forward to when the council can actually meet. And I think that this, that, you know, at least the businesses can sue the, the city, the county, and the state through the federal government because this isn't what our Constitution was, was designed for at all. So thank you very much. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? If so, please uh, call one of the numbers that is on your screen and press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, uh, you'll hear an announcement and the timer will be set to two minutes. Okay. Uh, seeing no further uh, members of the public who'd like to speak to this item, I'll bring it back to Council for Action Deliberation. And I see a hand up by Council, uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I'm uh, ready to, to move the item, but I'm happy to um, continue to have discussion with the uh, remaining uh, remaining council members, um, but I'm happy to make a motion when, when the time is ready. Thank you. Um, council Member Watkins. Uh, 
Um, uh, thank you, Mayor. I was just seeing if maybe Mr. Kondati wanted to speak to some of the uh, legal questions that were brought up in regards to the to the ordinance or to the resolution. Well, I guess I would like to respond to the comment about the authority to primarily abate a nuisance by vacating a building. Um, I think if you look at the whole theme of Chapter uh, 220, it doesn't just speak to the abatement of uh, dangerous buildings. It also uh, gives the uh, emergency services director the authority to make and issue rules and regulations on matters reasonably related to the protection of life and property as affected by such emergency uh, to obtain vital supplies, equipment, and other, prop uh, and other property found lacking in need for the protection of life and property of people. Uh, require emergency services of any city officer or employee, requisition necessary personnel or material in any uh, of any city department or agency, uh, and execute all of his or, or her ordinary powers as a city officer and special powers conferred by um, by the municipal code and um, by any statute of uh, agreement or other lawful authority. And so uh, not only was the city manager as a director of emergency services implementing his authority under chapter 220, but he was also uh, implementing the county health officers uh, shelter in place order and safe, uh, safe distancing uh, regulations in a manner that, uh, you know, looking at it as um, a cooperative effort between the police department, uh, city manager's office, and the city attorney's office was, was um, might appear to some as a blunt instrument, but it was really intended to narrowly address specific hazardous conditions that were observed in connection with these activities. So, um, so it's not just authority to abate the dangerous building. Thank you. Um, Council Member Brown, and then, yeah, Council Member Brown. <laughs> yeah, hi, thank you, Tony, for um, reviewing that for us, uh, because I do think there's, uh, you know, there is some confusion there, it is a bit of a gray area, and I do continue to have concerns that some of these actions that have been taken uh, under the emergency order are seem to be targeting food, not bombs. And I understand that it's a challenging situation and we do need to um, be uh, first and foremost thinking about uh, public health and safety. And at the same time, I do have some questions about the uh, kind of methods that were used, the process by which uh, those those uh, actions were taken um, as Tony, I think you said, a blunt instrument. And it does seem like quite a blunt instrument. And, you know, I, I just hope that we can remember that, uh, you know, Food Not Bombs is providing food survival gear and food to people who would not otherwise get it. And so I really just want to, again, put out my a plea to try to find a way to ensure that uh, they can continue to, to provide the, those critical services and do it in a way that's um, safe. And, um, you know, I, I just, you know, it's, I'm just frustrated and I don't know exactly how to articulate it, but I, I just feel like there's, there's more of a conversation to be had uh, rather than just, uh, you know, taking the enforcement track and kind of shutting off public spaces. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, I thank you for the clarification on the legal authority. Tony, I guess I would just I guess I would just follow up with that, and I thank you, uh, Councilmember Brown. I appreciate your comments. I I, I think this is also an iterative iterative process. Um, I think that as Ms. O'Hara uh, outlined, the, the city staff has been attempting to work with Mr. McHenry to ensure that the service can continue to be provided so long as it's done in a, in a, in a safe and orderly way. And so I think that's everybody's uh, goal here. And I also think that looking back on uh, these past few weeks with hindsight, we will um, we'll reflect on the actions that have been taken and, and maybe we'll conclude that we could have done things differently or better, but we're also 
operating under very um, intense uh, pressure right now to, to be as responsive as we can um, and to keep the public safe and to, and to also do so in a way that respects uh, civil liberties and, and people's legitimate interests. Um, so my thank, thank you for your comments. I'd also like to follow up on that because I just want to make sure that folks are aware that uh, I think it was the Thursday before we were going to um, kind of, we, after we had been issuing notices to the people who were at the post office that they would need to move. Um, I personally went with Matt Nathanson to go speak to uh, Food Not Bombs about their food distribution. And there's a video online where I was trying to see whether there were ways of how we could work together in terms of collaborations between the city and Food Not Bombs. Um, throughout that conversation, one of the things that happened was that when we had, um, we had suggested Food Not Bombs moving up towards the Benchlands, where we had um, one of our shell sites, and additionally there was more space for public distancing. At that meeting, um, one of the things that Food Not Bombs asked for was whether we would be able to allow them to stay at the clock tower for that weekend as they were able to establish a new food distribution site up uh, at the Benchlands so that they could communicate to people and let them know that they would be moving. By the next day of Food Not Bombs, when we tried to follow up on the conversation, um, they had another series of demands and that they weren't willing to move up there at that point in time. Uh, the conversation went on for some time and was um, pretty unproductive, and at which point um, the communication between myself and Food Not Bombs seemed like it wasn't making any traction in terms of the collaboration between the city and Food Not Bombs. Um, that being said, we still allowed Food Not Bombs to continue to operate over the entire weekend as we agreed to um, at the clock tower. And then when uh, the fences were put in place, Food Not Bombs moved up to the Benchlands as we had discussed and continued conversations were happening with the city. So I just wanna you know, make sure that it's clear to the public that we are trying to work with Food Not Bombs. That was back in March, Food Not Bombs is still operating and we're still trying to find ways to ensure food distribution to people who are most vulnerable in our community. So I don't want it to seem as if we're picking on Food Not Bombs. What we're trying to do is ensure that you know, we're providing a space for them, that we're providing um, clear, sound regulations on how they can distribute food in a way that meets the guidelines of the um, county health officer and public health so that not only are we providing people with food, but it's done in a way that's sanitary, that it's done in a way that's gonna you know, ensure that we're um, maximizing social distancing because as many people will remember as well, um, there was also the instance when Food Not Bombs um, kind of orchestrated a, uh, a rally after the shelter in, in, in place orders came out uh, around motel vouchers. And that was clearly a violation of the county health orders where there was you know, possibly close to 100 people within that space that's at the clock tower really putting people in that community at risk. And that is the one thing that we are trying to do with all the orders that we're putting forward is to increase health, to maximize health, to ensure that we're following the health officer's guidelines to make sure that um, especially people in the homeless population are um, being cared for and, and we don't see COVID-19 breaking out in that population. So I just wanted to follow up on that, Council Member Brown, since I have been directly involved with that. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say one quick thing, because I know there are a lot of people who want to make comments, but just in response to that, I, I, I do want to say I really appreciate all of your efforts to um, try to um, find uh, an amenable uh, you know, setup for Who Not Bombs. But just in one other comment that I, I hope I can just impress upon everybody that, um, you know, I read the MOU. I think it was all totally reasonable. And I, I think that we could be a little bit more um, uh, proactive about identifying a site where they can operate. Um, I think that, you know, the Benchlands was a good idea, and then it flooded uh, right when they got the opportunity to go there. So, you know, I don't want to go into all the details, but I think siting is really critical, and um, that's a conversation um, I would hope that you all could have. And I'm, this is also to Keith, if you're out there listening. Thanks. Um, Councilmember Byers. Um, 60 days. Uh, maybe, Martin, you could address that. Uh, at least a lot of my friends or phone calls I got assumed now that you have to stay in place for 60 days. 
uh, first place a lot of people saw it and they jumped to a conclusion. So I, I'm assuming you just picked that so you didn't have to come back to us. But would you just go over it for the public that I hope is watching? Yes. yes. Uh, so the uh, we don't know what the uh, the current uh, shelter in place or order uh, is in place uh, until May 3rd, but we expect that that's going to be extended. We don't know what that time is. Time frame is the state shelter in order is uh, doesn't have a, a, a deadline. It's uh, until further notice. Um, so the intent here is there's just a 60 day parameter that's in the in the ordinance that says, you know, it's in effect for 60 days and then uh, it has to be renewed uh, uh, no more than 60 days. Yeah. Uh, so then, uh, but uh, however, if the emergency is concluded before the 60 days, then this would uh, not be in effect anymore. So, and also the council could bring it up at any time to, uh, uh, to essentially rescind the declaration if it doesn't need to do that. But we wouldn't normally operate if uh, the, the emergency didn't right. exist anymore. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. The authority would last for 60 days. The specifics of the authority could vary week by week as they have been and as they will, as, we, as the right. policy directions and other, yeah. other conversations come down. So those are two different things. Um, regarding uh, the ratification of orders, um, I do favor that, and I just want to go on the record. Let's be benign, that the, let's be uh, realistic, that the city, I believe, has gone out of its way to work with Food Not Bombs. Uh, Food Not Bombs has been uh, uh, difficult, quite frankly. Uh, in some ways that the mayor has mentioned and others that um, I think are well known. And we got many, 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 many complaints from the public at the time that there was a large gathering at the town clock and so forth, expressing the concern that that was violating public health uh, orders and putting people at risk. So uh, that wasn't necessarily reflected in the latest flurry of emails, but that was certainly part of the um, uh, executive orders when they were put into place. They were responding to what was perceived as a significant public health risk. And uh, so um, just saying that, I want to uh, fully support the ratification of these and realizing also that we were responding in real time to a, a completely unfamiliar crisis. And I do believe people were making their best efforts to put forth um, protection of public health. I support what Sandy mentioned. Yes, to the extent we can work with Food Not Bombs to um, enable them to deliver food services in a way that is safe, by all means, let's proceed. That takes two partners. Councilman Brown, did you have a, you raised your hand, I think, a second time, but. No, that was just, um, I raised my hand, but then I jumped in, so thank you. <laughs> Lowering my hand. Um, I would just like to say um, that, you know, we, I know that people are, are really frustrated with the situation that we're in and want to move forward very quickly. Uh, I think that we're fortunate that we have so much access to technology that's really going to help us um, move more quickly on trying to, um, you know, contain COVID-19, move forward. But, um, you know, there's been a really slow response at our federal level and we're doing really well, but we can't just open up our community, even though we're doing well um, to business as usual, given that we will see a huge influx of people from other areas and we can put our community at even higher risk. Uh, the, the last time we saw a pandemic of this magnitude, it lasted for 36 months. And while I don't anticipate, well, I would hope actually I should say that we're able to contain this a lot much more quickly, um, it's going to take a joint global effort in order for us to, you know, really be in a position where we can get back to business as usual. And so in the meantime, I think we all uh, need to continue to do our best to shelter in place. Uh, we need to continue to be patient. And um, we're going to be following the, the lead of the state on this one. So when the state, you know, thinks it's okay that we uh, remove our emergency orders, um, I would anticipate that that's when we will, we as a community will also lift our orders and we will be continuing to follow the lead of the state, which has done extremely well given its population to um, this pandemic. And so um, I'm happy to support this item. Um, and again, to the extent we can work with food distributors in our community, um, there's a multitude of people who are willing to step up. I think that we should continue to work with those individuals. 
Senator Myers. Yeah, I'd like to uh, go ahead and make a motion um, to approve the resolution extending the emergency declaration in connection with COVID-19 pandemic by 60 days and ratifying confirming Director of Emergency Services Order numbers 2020-01 through 2020-06. I'll second that. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by the mayor. Um, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers. Aye. Yes. Uh, Brown. Uh, yes. Matthews. Uh, yeah. I. I. But I want to register a no vote on exec, uh, ratifying executive actions. Uh, the first and second one. But oh, I see. Mm -hmm. the rest. Just yeah, just those two. I, I think that they could have been done differently. Thank you. Uh, Matthews. Aye. Holder. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers. Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. That motion passes with um, items numbers three, four, and five unanimously, and with um, Council Member Brown voting no on the ratification and certification of the. Um, 2020-01 and 2020-02. I think the way that works is that the minutes, Bonnie should just reflect that Councilmember Brown expressed her opposition to items numbers one and two. I, I, I don't think it affects the actual register of the vote. Right, okay. That clarification. Okay, so we are moving on to um, item number 18 which is an ordinance amending Santa Cruz Municipal Code section 4.02.021, which identifies various city positions authorized to issue certain citations. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for action and deliberation. And with that, I will turn this over to City Attorney uh, Tony Condotti for the presentation. Thank you, uh, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. So, um, I guess I had I have heard um, that a number of members of the public have raised some significant alarm uh, about this ordinance and. Um, and, and I just heard it described as a massive uh, unleash of city personnel toward um, uh, new enforcement activities. And so I just, I'd like to start by just clarifying that, that that's not what this is about. Um, this is what I would characterize as a fairly uh, benign housekeeping measure. Uh, it's merely just updating our municipal code to make it consistent with the current organizational structure of the city. So under the existing municipal core code, um, enforcement of various codes and regulations is typically done by the department that's charged with implementation of the particular uh, ordinance or the particular chapter or section of the municipal code. Thus, uh, for instance, the water department is responsible for enforcement of provisions relating to water service, uh, like the regulations that prohibit um, uh, customers from manipulating their own uh, water meter. Um, the public work is authorized to enforce uh, provisions related to source control for the sewer system or for storm drain. Uh, the finance department is authorized to enforce provisions of the municipal code relating to business licenses and transient occupancy taxes, um, the building department for building codes, et cetera, um, planning department for uh, land use and zoning issues. So, um, so that is why in the existing municipal code, these different departments have designated uh, officers or employees who have the authority to issue citations for municipal code violations. Uh, now, you might recall that a year or so ago, the organizational structure of the city was realigned with um, 
between the Parks and Rec Department and the Fire Department and the Police Department, with the most part rangers being moved in, uh, in the structure or in, in the organi organizational chart from under the umbrella of the Parks and Recreation Department uh, to the Police Department. And lifeguards were transferred from the Parks and Recreation Department to the Fire Department. Uh, and so, so um, what this, uh, the impetus for this ordinance was to simply realign that authority in the municipal code to make it consistent with the current organizational structure of the city. Um, we took the opportunity at the same time to uh, circulate a draft to the different departments to make sure that the specific titles of the positions that have enforcement authority uh, within the individual departments, uh, uh, that they are consistent with the actual organizational structure. I'm, and I'm, I'm going to attempt to share a screen and if, um, so bear with me a second. Hopefully I'll be able to get this up in front of you. So, so this is section 4.02.021, authority to issue notices to appear. Is that visible on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I'm going to just go down this and sort of, uh, without going over every uh, minute detail, because some of this is just cleanup language, I'm just going to um, sort of go over real briefly what this is all about. Um, and bear with me. Okay, so you'll see here under fire department, uh, the, the, stricken, the stricken language refers to fire deputy chief, fire marshal, deputy fire marshal, fire inspector, fire battalion chief, fire captain. Tony, can I stop you for one sec? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if this is on everyone's screen, but I just see a zoomed in um, <laughs> 4.02.021. Some, something must have happened to your screen. We're not seeing what you're seeing. Yeah. All right, I apologize. I am going to try this again. I think if you just zoom out, we'll be able to see it. Oh, my, um, it says Zoom is not responding, so I think what I will do is stop sharing my screen. Try, try uh, yeah, try uh, stop it and then reload it, Tony. Okay. Okay, I think he's, it looks like he got it. He's got it. No, this is a different item. Mm -hmm. No, that's not the right one. Um, Tony, do you want to email it to me and we'll get it up? Okay, this is the one I want to show you.
can see that. Yeah, we can see that. Yep. So we can just scroll down at this point. Um, should probably work. Yeah. Okay. So under the current code, it lists the various uh, fire officials that have enforcement authority. Um, rather than have these individually listed, the code would be amended to say all sworn personnel in the fire department have the authority to issue citations. And then the Marine safety officer and beach lifeguards are, are moved from parks and recreation to the fire department as part of this ordinance. Uh, similar, the ranger and the beach captain, uh, supervising ranger, etc., are moved either to the police department or to the fire department. And then there's some cleanup language too, for instance, <clears throat> adding recreation superintendents, urban foresters and city arborists, uh, recreation supervisors and aquatic uh, work supervisor, golf course superintendent, um, and park supervisors as having authority. Omitting cashier and beach lifeguard, uh, the lifeguards again are going to the fire department. Planning director, in the planning department, it's just um, modifying this to make the authorities consistent with the current titles of the different um, positions in the planning department. Police department, um, uh, in addition to clarifying the specific title of community services officer, the ranger one, two, senior ranger, and temporary classifications are moved to the police department or under the umbrella of the police department instead of under under the Parks and Recreation Department. And that is essentially what this is all about. It's purely just realigning the enforcement authority uh, under the code with the current organizational structure of the city. And um, it, it doesn't increase the amount of enforcement that the city will be able to do. Uh, it also doesn't decrease it. It doesn't change it at all. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions or respond to comments. And again, I uh, would like to apologize for the uh, technical difficulties. Thank you. I'll bring it back to council for questions. Councilman Brown. Uh, thank you, Tony, uh, once again. I, I actually don't have a question because I got my questions answered in advance, but it made me think about uh, just a quick comment. I really appreciate the clarification uh, about what this is, really a cleanup uh, of our current ordinance, and it's not uh, you know, an expansion of police powers. Um, in this kind of instance, it would be really helpful to see that red line version in our agenda packet because I think, you know, for, for mostly for the public, I mean, council members, we can fall in or, you know, talk to um, department heads and others to get clarification on these things, but it leaves the public wondering and then communicating with us uh, about it. Um, so, whereas if it had been more clear in this case that it was uh, just a cleanup, it might not have been such a um, topic of conversation. So, but thank you for clarifying now. And that is our normal practice, and that was an oversight on my part, and I, and I just, uh, you know, apologize to members of the public who might have been misled or confused by what we were actually doing. Councilmember Byers. Uh, do we have any sense of um, the number of citations or where they come from? Does anyone keep track? I'm just thinking of Locke Loman being up there one time and couple people got citations, rightly so. They, uh, it was clear what they were doing wrong, but does anyone track them? We certainly maintain records of all of the citations that are issued and um, yeah. occasionally there are requests for that type of data and, and so it's been uh, compiled uh, on occasion. Uh, last year in response to requests from the council to uh, provide some statistical data on citations for various municipal code uh, uh, infractions. Um, so yes, that information is available. Thank you, John. Any further questions from council members? All right, seeing none. Um, right now we are hearing item number 18, ordinance amending Santa Cruz Municipal Code Section 4.02.021, 
which identifies various city positions authorized to issue certain citations. If you're a member of the public, uh, there should be some phone numbers on the screen if you're uh, watching from home. If you're interested, please call in. After you've called in, please press nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes and you will be able to speak. Uh, it looks like Robert Norris from Huff has called, has uh, contacted the city council early and will be given four minutes. And so Robert Norris, um, please let us know uh, when you're on the line so that we can give you the time that you've requested. Okay. My first caller. Okay, I guess that's me. Yep. Okay. Um, I too, um, assuming that Tony is uh, is accurate and inclusive in what he's saying, which, you know, I I can't vouch for it either way. I'm concerned, of course, that the April 8th order by Bernal included uh, 11 categories, and then seemingly this ordinance adds 32 new categories, um, many with multiple members. But I mean, if it's only for enforcement of the actual business of that particular agency, and, and I, I would hope that that would be the case, and I would I actually, I now I would assume it's the case in spite of what initially alarmed me about this. Um, I guess um, I'm less concerned about it than I was. Um, I, would, I would echo also, uh, for other reasons, uh, Council Member Byers' question about uh, the kinds of citations that have been issued in the last month and a half to people, uh, not just for the uh, coronavirus spacing violations, but also uh, homeless violations generally, uh, because this is, includes the safety of people in their encampments. So I would request the council uh, I'm direct that this be, in fact, be made public for those of us who want to see it and, and up to date so we can be reassured that homeless people are being given the kind of treatment that Susie O'Hara earlier assured us they were. Um, I don't know why in an emergency you need to bring up housekeeping matters like this. I mean, it's a little unclear to me why there is a concern about doing this in a situation where the public can't even enter the council chambers. Many people probably don't know how to get into the public to make comments. I'm not saying on this particular item necessarily, but this item is one of many, some of which uh, are of real concern to members of the public, and they don't have access to them. And of course, lots of technical problems with actually getting this out, which I realize you're trying to solve, but they still exist. So, I mean, it, it may kind of lay the groundwork for Brown Act violations if people, the public does not have real access to this stuff. And I think it's, uh, I don't know, I think it's important if you to leave the, uh, the technicalities, the details, and the housekeeping stuff insofar as you can and not imperil funding and so forth and public health and safety to a later time when the public can actually be present. Uh, thanks for the time. Thank you very much. All right, Good evening, on. this is Scott Graham. Um, I'm concerned with, is, is this a limited time thing for these extra people that are being deputized during this pandemic? so that the city can collect more $1,000 checks from people that are violating this? Is this a way of like filling the coffers uh, because they're not getting, you know, hotel tax, they're not getting uh, sales tax and the like. So let's go out, we'll get all the city employees to go out and give people $1,000 tickets. Um, it seems to be a little overreaching and I just like to say that I tried to get in on the last conversation. You know, I got in and I pressed star nine and I never got a chance to speak. So this system you're using right now really stinks. And I hope you can come up with something better in the future if we're gonna continue to have these remote meetings. I'm done. Thank you. 
you very much. Hello, City Council and everybody who's a witness to this democracy. My name is Jane Jimmy Whitman, and in the interim, I, from the last time that I took notes on what Tony talked about as far as the $1,000 fine, $500 fine, slap on the wrist, $250 fine, um, I've taken 30 pages of notes. I'd love to show anybody in the City Council my notes, but see, here are my comments. And this, you know, I wish that if I was saying something negative, I was saying it just to one person, but I'm not. This is herder ship chain of command with every person in the city of Santa Cruz. And now even more employees have the, in the city have an opportunity to bully any citizen they want. I will repeat, there are some major things going on with Earth's biosphere, and the food chain has been cut off. And here we are focusing on stuff like this and people hiding. Um, there's some stuff that needs to change. And uh, the shelter in place is not helping 20 friends of mine with businesses in Santa Cruz and my business. And I'm sure, I don't know what's going to happen in 60 days. So anyway, I appreciate this democracy. I wish it were a little bit better, but it is what it is. Thank you very much. I'm done. Hello, my name is Elise Casby. Um, can you all hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. First of all, I want to say that um, there have been a lot of technical problems with actually viewing this city council meeting. I've never had it uh, happen before with this computer. Um, so I just want to say that I think this is a very, very dangerous step, uh, especially considering the fascist tendencies that have become right from uh, the city manager's office, the city government. Um, there has just been so much deception of uh, the, the public are not being told the truth, not about what happened at the Ross camp, not about the campaign uh, to recall our, our members. And so for me, this is exactly what I would expect of an increasing police state. To begin with, the COVID-19 is not proving itself to be the, um, the danger that we have been warned about. Uh, the numbers worldwide, statewide, and regional show that it is much more following a normal flu virus, a flu type virus curve. So I am very concerned about all the, you know, the supposed housekeeping, the misinforming of the public about what you're exactly doing. So I'm just going to say that it seems to me that you're working to deputize and create a Himmler-esque uh, citizen police force to divide the city further. There are not being enough masks provided at the stores for everybody to ask excess masks. And I just strictly don't trust the city staff. The city of Santa Cruz has been proving to be a very um, morally bankrupt city on the whole. And I, I feel that this is, sorry to be so blunt, but um, I feel that the times are just, uh, I need to say what I feel the truth is, and that this is a fascist measure to control uh, the populace. Thank you. Okay. Um, seeing no other members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. And uh, council member Watkins. Yeah, I'm just prepared to move the ordinance amending Santa Cruz Municipal Code section four. Point oh two point oh two one, um, which identifies various city positions authorized to issue certain citations. Second. Okay. We have a motion made by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Any further discussion on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll pass it over to uh, the referral call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers. You're muted, Catherine. Aye. Matthew? Aye. Brown? Aye. 
Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Sorry, aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Tony, for bringing that to us at this time. Thank you, Council. Okay, with that, we will move on to item number 19 on our agenda, which is the Go Santa Cruz Downtown Employee Transportation Demand Management Six Month Program Update and Mid Year Recommendations. Good, e Good evening, Mayor and Council. Claire Gilligley, Transportation Planner for Public Works. And today I'll be going through our six month program update for the Go Santa Cruz Downtown Employee Transportation Demand Management Program. I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully this is flawless. And okay, so as I mentioned, um, this is an update on the Go Santa Cruz Transportation Demand Management Program. An overview of what that is, I know we have some council members who are new and weren't here at the time that we implemented, um, but the overall goals of the program are to reduce the drive alone rate within downtown for employees to below 50%. Um, to offer transportation options for employees that meet them where they are, recognizing that there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. And finally, to maximize the availability of our parking resources, recognizing that we're, we're really in a parking crunch. A general program timeline, between 2017 and 2018, we worked extensively with the Downtown Commission on doing two downtown employee commute surveys, asking people what their preferences were and how they would actually like to shift modes, as well as doing a lot of work to develop the overall downtown parking rate strategy. Then on September 11th, 2018, City Council adopted our parking rate strategy, which sunsetted the uh, business deficiency fee downtown, increased uh, hourly and daily pricing, increased permit pricing, and set an overall downtown TDM budget at $300,000 per year. Following that up, on February 11th, 2019, we came to Council uh, with our program recommendations for a Go Santa Cruz program, and Council ended up adopting Scenario 4 with a $585,000 budget. We'll come back to that towards the end of this presentation. Um, after that time, we spent the next couple months working on executing all of the contracts and agreements and MOUs that were required to get this program rolling, and then intentionally didn't launch our program until October 1st, 2019, um, just about six months ago now, in order to make sure that we were through the summer season when we have a lot of transient employees in the downtown, as well as to allow for UCSC and Cabrillo to come back and be in session, and very importantly, for those students to already have the transit passes that they get through their educational institutions. An overview of what the program includes, and I'll be brief in this, knowing that you guys are, have had a very long day. Um, we give transit passes to any downtown employee that wants them through a partnership with Metro. This is an annual, annual pass, which is good on all local service, so everything except for the Highway 17 Express, and it can be used an unlimited amount of times. And then each month we pay Metro a flat rate, and we get a analysis of the monthly ridership. Bike locker cards, these are cards that are preloaded with $20. We have about 100 bike lockers located throughout the downtown and they offer secure bike storage. This directly addresses what we heard in our downtown employee commute surveys that many people had concerns about bike theft. They would be willing to ride their bikes, but it made them nervous to leave them locked outside. So offering a safe and secure alternative there. Tenth benefits, something we're really proud of, a first of its kind a commute trip reduction program in partnership with JUMP. We give downtown employees $2 off per trip for 60 trips in a 90-day period. This is based off the um, estimate that there's about 20 work days per month, so it gets you your workday commute to and from work each quarter. At the end of the quarter, if you request another benefit, we'll give you another code and keep you riding. And then we give rewards. This is another part we're really proud of. If you log 10 carpool trips in our online commute management platform, we'll give you $10 in downtown dollars. If you log 25 alternative trips of any kind, we'll give you $10 in downtown dollars. And we can also run special challenges, like we did a fall in love with carpool challenge in the month of February. An important thing here is that this entire program is funded by the parking district. 
and it's funded by increases in that I had mentioned in our meters, our lots, our structures, and our permits. And knowing that that's a sensitive thing for downtown businesses, it was really important for us to keep that revenue as benefiting to downtown employees and to invest in downtown dollars so that downtown employees are then frequenting downtown businesses. This is really easy to get started. You can go to the link on your screen or citysantacruz.com slash go Santa Cruz. You sign up by putting in your name, your email address, and your home and work address. You scroll down to the My Rewards section and you select the benefits you want. Um, and then someone, me or my colleague Joanna, physically comes and delivers you your transportation benefits, your bus pass or your um, bike locker card, and we explain and answer any questions you have. So many people ask questions about, um, you know, how do I take the bus or how do I know where the bus goes or how do I use a bike locker card? So physically delivering them, although it's very high touch as part of the program, offers another opportunity to do further outreach. And another benefit is that oftentimes when we go to a uh, business to drop these off, the person that we're dropping them off for oftentimes isn't there, but one of their colleagues is. So it's another opportunity to do outreach. Overall program metrics to date. Note these stop at the end of February. We didn't want to um, give you a kind of skewed idea with post-COVID uh, analysis there. So between October and February, we had 999 downtown employees sign up for the program. To put that in context, we estimate that we have just over 4,000 employees downtown. So it's about 25% saturation, which in the world of transportation is astronomical and huge. Um, of this, we've had 629 transit passes distributed, 242 jump benefits, 143 bike link cards, and 390 rewards claimed. I'll go into these in a little bit more detail, but also there's, there's some pretty extensive detail in your staff report. Other key stats since October, Joanna, my colleague, has been tracking her mileage as she walks around downtown handing out these benefits, and she's gone over 110 miles at this point to distribute benefits. So she's pounding the pavement every day. Downtown employees have logged almost 14,000 alternative commute trips for almost 50,000 miles, which is two times around the world. It's pretty huge. Um, and we've reduced 14.8 tons of carbon dioxide. The program rates, one of the cool things of having a commute management platform is that when people do put in their home and their work address, we can see their origins and destinations. And this is a really zoomed out version, but it's just meant to give you a general overview. We see most people coming from within city limits, Live Oak, and Capitola. Although we do see people that are coming from as far as Coralitas and into the Bay Area who are using our commute management platform. This gives us a lot of information about how we can inform future parts of our program and make recommendations. As part of our two downtown employee commute surveys, what we heard loud and clear was that biking was the option that most people were most likely to choose if they were to switch modes. And knowing that so many people that we have participating are from within, are from within about a three mile commute shed, it means that biking is a, a really uh, available option to many of those folks. We also are really proud that we've reached over 168 unique businesses in the downtown. Um, it's been a really great way to do outreach directly in businesses, walk up, knock on the door, leave information behind, and then pretty immediately come back to deliver benefits as people are signing up. So we're excited that they're spread throughout the downtown, they're in all sectors from retail and restaurant to government to office to tech to nonprofit. We have large businesses and sole proprietorships, and uh, we're, we're really proud of the program reach. I'm gonna go through each of the different elements of the program and give you just a, a high level overview of the data highlight. And at the end of this, I'm gonna focus on Metro because that uh, specifically relates to my program recommendation today. So in education and encouragement, we know that if we're getting more people that are changing their modes, we wanna make sure that they know how to do that safely. So we partnered with Ecology Action. They hosted five downtown urban riding workshops. They've reached over 150 downtown employees. And through these, they've also been distributing safety equipment. So we've distributed 160 bike light sets and 145 helmets. It's something I hear all the time in my outreach that lights and helmets are so huge and it's what the data plays out as well. Um, and what we heard, because as we're doing these outreach workshops, uh, they're live in person and we're, we're asking people for feedback, both in a pre and a post survey. 
And the majority of people who are attending are beginner and intermediate cyclists who are really interested in learning more about how to ride safely. 59% uh, of them are not regular bike commuters. And the biggest barrier to keeping people from riding is that they are, they're fearful of riding next to traffic. And so we make sure that we talk about basic skills, where do you ride in the road, hand signals, and it's, um, it's a really good program. I think we've gotten a lot of really good feedback there. As part of this program also, we do do outreach on all other modes that are included in the Go Santa Cruz program. So when Ecology Action is doing the urban riding workshop, they're also talking about carpool and transit and jump um, and signing up for the commute management platform. So it's a good way to do a lot of outreach. For biking, the bike walkers, we had a ton of interest at the very beginning. We distributed 143 cards. Of those, only 30 were activated and only 15 were used. Of those that were used, they were parked for about uh, 975 hours. And one of the things here, we were looking forward to doing the next phases of our bike locker update to downtown. Uh, we recently put that on hold as we're analyzing what we do in response to coronavirus. But hopefully in the future retrofitting those lockers, we can do some more marketing behind the bike locker program and get more of those cards in use. For the JUMP program, we've distributed 242 incentives. 140 of those were redeemed and 71 were used, so a higher percentage there. And an interesting fact there, we get a lot of information from JUMP. The average trip distance that was taken through this program was about one mile. Um, it's about half the distance of our usual JUMP ridership, and it gives us a good, uh, good grasp of who are the people that are riding, where are they riding. Likely many of these trips are errands that otherwise would have been taken by car, going and grabbing lunch by bike rather than taking your car, or you live pretty close and maybe you were driving before, but jump is an easier option for you. So we're excited about the, uh, the benefits we've gotten back from that. Then getting into transit, um, I'm going to spend the most time here, as you've seen in my program recommendation, we are asking for council direction to renegotiate our contract with Metro. Um, since October 1st, we've taken just shy of 13,000 trips, 12,978 uh, to be exact. We've distributed 629 cards and roughly half of those are in use. An important thing here is that the, the year-to-date cost has been $129,632 and the average cost per trip of $9.99. When we initially brought this contract forward, it was a proposal by Metro that then we had council direction to enter into. We pay a flat monthly rate to Metro regardless of actual use. So we would pay the same amount per month if we had one person ride the bus or if we had 5,000 people ride the bus. It wouldn't matter, the flat rate. Um, and what we've seen with the data is that we are not having program utilization that warrants the way that we've set it up. Going into further detail, our current contract, the flat rate is just shy of $26,000 per month. Uh, year to date, we've paid just shy of $130,000. What I would propose doing is working t with Metro towards an actual cost model. So if um, Joe on the street were to walk up to the bus and get on, that ride would cost him $2 per trip. If we had paid that $2 per trip since the start of the program, those 12,978 trips would have cost us roughly the same program to date as one single month of what we've paid. Um, so my recommendation would be to work towards that. The, the caveats in this recommendation are that transit is an absolutely vital component of any program that we put forward, and there's no scenario that I envision that we don't work with Metro on a partnership to deliver transit options for downtown employees. Um, as part of this, the city has, you know, it bought into this program. We've done our due diligence in trying to get these passes out. I mentioned Joanna individually has walked over 110 miles throughout downtown. And despite pounding the pavement, doing lunch and learns and outreach events and going directly to employers and being out at all sorts of other events and doing marketing, we just have not had enough people interested in this program to want a transit pass. Um, as I said, we, we distributed just over 600 of them. About half of those have been used. Um, 
Metro also didn't take on, as, as no part of it, they didn't add new service or expand hours or take on any significant costs in order to roll this program out. So changing our method of delivery wouldn't be something that they weren't getting a return on investment that they had made, and I'm sensitive to that. And our contract does allow for renegotiation with 30 days notice. We, um, we did speak to Metro. I sent their CEO a notification uh, on the 13th that we were going to be bringing this to council. And uh, we've had some back and forth with him. I believe you've all received a letter from him as well. And uh, as I understand, it's a tough time for Metro and it's a tough time for us. In the context of the parking district, which provides all of the funding for this program, we are losing over $600,000 per month in anticipated revenue. So we're looking at all options for how we save on costs. And this is one of the low hanging fruit options that we would still be able to deliver a transportation benefit at a more affordable rate to the city where Metro would still be able to get a revenue stream and downtown employees would still have access to transit. Um, so with that, my recommendation is to consider the impact of the first six months of the expanded Go Santa Cruz Transportation Demand Management Program for downtown employees and direct staff to renegotiate the contract with Santa Cruz Metro. And I'm available for any questions that you have. Um, let me know if you'd like me to stop sharing my screen or to leave it up as well. Thanks, Claire, um, for that presentation. I've been using, I just want to say that I've been using, I was using the jump bike to sign up for this program and, and uh, really got me to change some of my behavior. So, uh, so it's a really great program to have and look forward to continuing to use it moving forward. Uh, before we go to questions from council, uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, uh, if, if this is an item that you want to comment on, um, we can change our screens to show the phone numbers. Um, now is a good time to call in using the instructions that uh, will be provided on the screen. <clears throat> um, if you're interested in commenting on this, uh, when we uh, go to public comment, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. Uh, but before we go to public comment uh, on this Mayor, item, I'll... Yeah. Sorry, can Claire unshare her screen so that our screen can go up with the phone numbers? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so at this time, are there any questions from council members on this item? Okay. Um, council member Brown. Oh, you're muted, by the way. Two mutes, sorry, I've got to keep track of them. Um, thank you for the presentation and all of your efforts to uh, work toward uh, multimodal alternative transportation for um, downtown and others, downtown workers and others. Um, and I, I also do appreciate your efforts to uh, to advertise and do outreach on the bus passes and kind of go with the um, notion that we wanted to make them available to anyone who was interested. Um, I think the data is clear that we need to look at how we do this in a different way, and so I absolutely support uh, uh, doing that. Um, but I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions about um, the, I mean, I, you've, you've detailed your, your outreach efforts. Um, do you, was there, and I know everything's up in the air because of the um, pandemic, but um, did you have in mind any particular goal for the number of bus passes that would be, um, distributed or you know other efforts to move towards a particular goal so that's one question um and then uh another question i have is um about is there any analysis available on the impact of um, parking pricing and transportation demand management to date i know it's early um uh, on parking availability so are there any is there any data on that um like is there more parking in what areas? Um, and then the last question I have is, is are you, have you talked with anybody at the county about how they address the bus pass situation? Because I think I have heard that um, they have been able to uh, work something out with the Metro where um, they do pay as you go um, through like book lists of uh, passes and things like that. So 
Uh, I'm just, if you haven't, I think that that might be something that we could talk with the Metro about as well. Um, Thanks. Yeah, so starting from the top, what our goal was at the beginning of this, when we set out last in 2017, 2018, our goal, which was a stretch goal, which was that at the end of this program, we would hope to have increased transit ridership to 10%. We were starting at around 6%. Um, the way that we're recommending changing that, changing our, how we pay for this program, would not change that goal in any way. My, my goal for this would still be to be able to deliver transit passes to all downtown employees, to still market the program, to still encourage people, to still help people change their mode. It would simply be changing the way that we pay for the program. And we could do that um, in the analysis we did for about a third of the cost of what we're paying now. Um, the second part, has there been any analysis of our parking demand as it relates I have not seen any drop in our parking demand, even with this. Uh, we still have a very long wait list at the parking window. That's something I didn't mention. Another way that we do outreach is that everyone that comes in to pick up their monthly parking permit, about 3,000 people, gets information about our program, and everyone on the parking wait list got information about our program as well. So we haven't seen a big impact there in terms of a drop in parking. Obviously, right now, we have a big impact because no one's coming downtown because they're staying home if they're supposed to. Um, but prior to that, we weren't seeing much of an impact. Um, third, in talking to the county, I've not talked to the county, I've talked to UCSC. And UCSC has done uh, a variety of different contracts with Metro, both flat rate and pay as you go. There's pros and cons to each, and generally you aim to make it that you provide transit in a cost-effective way to the group of people, and you aim for the general cost per trip to be around the cost of actually taking transit. And we're seeing right now about a 5x um, above that. So there's, there's ways that we could do it. We could do a, a cost per trip that has a slight escalation on it so that Metro is able to recoup some costs for their staff time related to sending us invoices and sending us the ridership information. Um, there, there are some ways there, but um, I can reach out to the county as well. But UCSC was pretty informative in talking about past contract negotiations. I had a couple questions, and I just realized that um, I tried sending an email out, but for whatever reason, I don't think it went out to you. Okay. Um, but um, two questions. One, I know this came pretty early after I was on council last year. Um, I, I thought I remember that when um, when this came before us, it didn't seem like there was an ability to kind of you know pay per trip at that time. Has that changed? It seemed like it was going to be a flat rate regardless, and we expanded to all workers versus just a proportion of the downtown workforce. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah. So um, when we came to council on February 11th of last year. Uh, staff had recommended scenario three, which included $100,000 for transit, roughly $100,000, and we would have bought um, essentially pay-as-you-go cards. Um, so you can get 15 ride passes or monthly passes or single ride passes um, and given those out. With the way that we've worked it out, we now have, and um, some of you may have received your Go Santa Cruz transit pass. I, don't have one handy right here. But those cards, uh, Metro is able to track the actual usage of them. So each time one is tapped on the fare box, they're tracking that a Go Santa Cruz rider has got on. So at the conclusion of every month, by the 15th of the next month, they send me a ridership report. And being able to pay per ride would be as simple as saying, last month we had 6,000 riders, so we're going to charge you $2 times that 6,000, and we would pay that bill. So we, we do have the ability to do that. Okay. Thanks for the clarification on that. The next question I had is related to the jump bikes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could kind of speak to how that contract was set up and um, just for clarification for members of the public that, you know, um, are we paying, like, did that contract put us in a position where we're continuing to pay them over time or is it kind of like monthly use? Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Specific to our um, Go Santa Cruz portion of the contract, correct? Yeah. So for that, we pay for each, we pay $60 for each of the jump codes that is actually redeemed. So if people request a benefit, but then they don't use it, 
we don't pay anything for that. Um, only those that are actually redeemed we pay for. Um, we have a not to exceed contract of $40,000 with Jump. We're well below our, our contract authorization on that now. So we, we only pay for what's actually cons consumed. Great. So now, uh, yeah, so during COVID-19, we're not paying into that at all. Yeah, nothing happening. And uh, as you know, also as a side note, Jump has pulled in all of their bikes at, at our direction to do that, to support the shelter in place efforts and to make sure that their employees and the public can remain safe as well. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to have a little bit of a follow-up question on the, um, so the eco, so the, the passes that we have from the bus, from the Metro, um, can we keep those if we go to the paint? Because I think there's value in having the data that comes from those passes versus a, a booklet that may, for example, you know, disappear in someone's backpack or get dropped on the ground. So then we, someone you know, we purchase something. Yeah, it's, we purchase something, but we really don't know whether or not it's going to be used. Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, does, does that trip also get tracked? Um, I'm assuming because you gave us the mileage and the carbon um, offsets. That, that trip? <laughs> card is also getting tracked in real time for the travel distances and other things as well, right? I mean, it's not just the fare. Um, is it getting, is, are we, is that how you're calculating that? I'm just curious how much information we're getting from somebody having a card and yeah. the value of that. So two separate things to that. So we have our commute management platform and we have that actually in partnership with the RTC. We went in together on purchasing a software system that people can sign up through. We were the guinea pig and the beta testers, so we rolled it out uh, very early and did all the, um, the testing there. And that's where people are going on and logging their trips. And so the distance is coming from people that go in and then self-report that they took transit or biked or did that. And we have a carrot behind that where when people do report their trip, they then accumulate enough points to get prizes, downtown dollars most of the time or other raffle prizes from downtown businesses. So on the flip, on, on that side, people report transit that they've taken, but they, they generally under-report under of all the trips that they've taken. On the other hand, Metro gives us actual ridership data from the fare box every month. So we know how many trips were taken, on what route they were taken, what time of day were they taken, how frequently was each card used, how many unique cards were used. We have a really depth of data there. So to your original point, I agree, being able to keep these cards in circulation would be a huge win for being able to monitor and manage the program. We also have the ability to turn these cards off and on. If people lose a card, we can turn that card off and issue them a new card. Um, so ideally, I would, I would love to be able to keep these cards in circulation and simply change the method of payment that we're using under this contract. Yeah, and it would seem that there's also just real benefit, just like a UCSC student, you know, I remember getting my cards, you know, and, and, and so you get used to having this thing that gives you all this freedom and you're able to, you know, you're not worrying about whether you've got the money or you're buying, the, you know, it just seems like the, the card the card piece is part of building a successful program um, rather than kind of using a different, maybe a different um, type of type of purchase. Are there, my final question was, are there funds needed um, in terms of the other modes that are part of the, of the program? Um, so for example, will some of these cost savings that we're gonna do, will that help with additional advertising? Will it help with, you know, getting, logging additional more, you know, being able to provide more for jump bikes once we are, we're open for business again in terms of things like that? So are the other, I guess the, my question is, are the other mode types um, are those, are those funds used up, you know, in terms of, of the program, especially if we're getting such a big hit on our parking, on our parking yeah. fund? So that's a, that's a really good question. Last week, I identified about $100,000 in cuts from the overall program budget. Those primarily came from anticipated cost savings as a result of this item, um, significantly, actually entirely cutting our carpooling budget, recognizing that on a, it's not allowed right now under the shelter in place order. You should not be carpooling with someone that does not live in your household. And um, B, thinking about transit and carpooling in general, even as we come out of a mandatory shelter in place order, psychologically, people that have any other option are not going to choose to ride with strangers for a long time until they feel like it's safe for their health. And so as we emerge from this,
business and we begin to reopen downtown, the modes that we're gonna be promoting most are going to be walking, biking, supporting telework, um, and promoting the mental and physical health benefits of that. We will likely see a rebound in the number of people that are driving alone to work, just simply because people are really struggling financially, people are struggling with employment, and, and they're really scared. So the parts of our program budget that we have tried to maintain as much as possible are those that support walking, biking, marketing, and education, which are the areas that we think will continue to see success as we come out of coronavirus and the areas that we'd anticipate people needing extra support. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Are there any other council members who have questions at this time? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'll go to the public, um, the public comment. Again, if we could get the numbers on the screen, um, if you'd like to call in, please call one of the numbers that will be appearing on your screen. Um, when you have joined the meeting, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the time will be set to two minutes. Can you hear me? My call was stopped earlier. Uh, we can hear you. Okay, excellent. Um, this is James Ewing Whitman. I want to thank Claire for the depth of the information. I believe somewhere early in your commentary, you said people were concerned about bike safety. So I'll comment on that at the end. I come from a family of bike riders. My mother, 37, of her 41 years, she rode her bike 85% uh, of the time to work, and sometimes that was 27 miles each way. I've never been a professional bicyclist, but I've been told by dozens of professional bicyclists that I made them look bad. Anyway, when I was teaching my son to ride bikes in the mountains, I said, if you hear a car coming, you get off your bike and you look at the driver. That's because my fellow neighbors in the mountains badmouth bicyclists, and that's a terrible way to die. You're not going to win if you get hit by a car. So my suggestion would be to uh, really pay attention, be polite, and make sure that the motorists see you. So thank you very much, Claire, for a wonderful opportunity. I would love to ride my bike to work. Thank you very much. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, uh, this is Matt Farrell. Um, I currently serve as chair of the Downtown Commission. I'm not speaking for the commission just for myself today but I encourage you to support staff's recommendation to authorize them to renegotiate the contract with Metro Transit. Thank you. Yeah. Next speaker. Good evening, council members. My name is Piet Kim from Ecology Action. And just like Matt said, I just also want to um, echo his sentiment to support staff recommendation to make this cost um, savings for this program. And then I also wanted to add that, you know, in terms of the TDM program and getting people to use um, fewer drive alone trips to get downtown, this program has been amazingly successful. Um, you know, Claire and her team did the necessary outreach. They used um, great um, incentives. They followed it up with um, an online program that, that's easy to use, that people can track their sustainable transportation trips with. And then, um, you know, being from Ecology Action, you know, we had a role in terms of doing the bike safety education, as one of the other callers said, is, is so important um, to have. And I would, I would ask the council, you know, to kind of build on this. Obviously, we're in this pandemic and everybody's looking for less restrictions. And as Claire said, too, you know, what are the modes of transportation, sustainable transportation, that people are going to be, you know, more favorably looked towards with um, shelter in place and social distancing? And so I would say, you know, if you can, you know, I know funds are, are um, you know, revenue is being reduced for especially the parking fees, but look for funds that can support um, increased biking because it's a form of sustainable transportation that people are using right now to get fresh air, to um, be able to de-stress from a very stressful situation that we're all in. Um, so you can see in neighborhood 
birds throughout Santa Cruz City. Santa Cruz families out riding their bikes that otherwise wouldn't be. I've seen people walking their bikes up Bay Street, so that tells me that's a, a new cyclist. So I would say, you know, if we can capture these new cyclists and when, you know, things get back to somewhat normal, that, you know, we can make those cyclists into regular transportation um, bike riders. And, you know, ways to do that is activate jump bikes as soon as possible. Maybe look at doing an electric bike rebate program, because that's a way to get people riding bikes more. And think of ways to, to increase biking. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, this is Kyle Kelly. Um, I just wanted to note uh, for biking, I would love to see more of the roads close to cars, generally throughout the city, like I was said before, uh, for people to, to be able to bike and walk more um, without having to be on narrow sidewalks or even areas where there's basically a lack of sidewalks. comments and uh, would echo some of the additional comments from my colleagues 
And also just to say that, you know, this is a, an iterative process. We, you know, it, it's going to take time to really um, see the, the real long-term, the benefits for this over the long term. And we are in a time when uh, things are uh, um, kind of seem to be uh, grinding to a halt, but I um, am confident that um, all of the work that's ha done, been done already and, you know, your efforts will continue um, will uh, begin to see um, that those efforts are, will um, will pay off and our uh, alternatives uh, will be uh, robust uh, uh, complement to driving and um, reducing our CO2 emissions obviously is like a, it's a huge, huge uh, goal for us and this is um, you know, one way that we can support that. So thank you. Okay. Dr. Matthews. Yeah, I'm happy to support this as well um, to uh, support the, to accept the report of Go Santa Cruz and to my mind it's been amazingly successful and had an incredible impact in the first six months. Um, the beauty is to my mind it was well thought out. All the research you did on employee desires and practices. It didn't just fall out of the sky. Um, the work that was done with uh, adjusting the parking rates and engaging partners to make um, ecology action. There have been so many components that have helped um, put this in place. So I think it's been well thought out, well promoted, well documented, and really enthusiastically embraced. And what I specifically appreciate as a player you and the, the partners you've worked with is um, looking how to make it better all the time. We understand we have a finite amount of resources. Um, it does take a while to change habits, but um, I appreciate that your interest is in improving the program. So um, congratulations. I went to one of the bike workshops. I'm not a bike rider, but I was so impressed. The turnout, the questions, the impact on the people who were there. So I think, and I also know that, that you and your, your team have gone out and individually met with business owners, with employees, promoted it actively through the downtown employee business community, um, really at a saturation level. It's, it's been so impressive. So um, good work. Keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor Myers. Yeah, uh, thank you again, Claire, and thank you for spending time with me on Monday to bring me up to date. So uh, this is an easy vote for me to make. Uh, for sure. This is, for me, I thank the council and the whatever council, the last council, for taking this on because it's been something talked about for years about helping the employees downtown not drive their cars. So I'm excited and glad to be part of it now. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Excuse me. Um, I just have a question, maybe, or consideration for the maker of the motion. Um, I think I heard a little bit more of a deeper um, potential direction, possibly, that the staff would like to explore, which is, and I, and I see some real benefit to this now that I've learned more about um, the cards and sort of how they function within the system. Uh, I'm wondering if the, the maker would be um, willing to potentially add to the motion um, direction that the uh, actual cost model as presented by staff be pursued in the, um, in the negotiation with Metro. Is that appropriate staff at this point in time? Yeah, that would be, um, ideally I would like to go with the actual cost model as, as a way that Metro will be reimbursed for all the trips that they provide, and I'd be willing to pay the full cost rather than a discounted rate there. And uh, downtown employees still have the same level of access, and we have a much more controlled level of costs on our end. And hmm. I'm saying this with full disclosure that I'm, I'm, I'm a Metro board member as well, so I, I am fully aware of the um, of the ramifications on Metro's budget, and especially in this year, um, and I and I would like to see if we can also add um, some type of um, you know cost allocation for Metro's 
you know, needing to bill us, needing to run the data, things like that. So I know, I think you looked at a, I think you had a figure of around $2, but I'd like to see, um, you know, I don't think it needs to go to $4 a, a trip, but, you know, some kind of cost, um, cost recovery. Um, and I also just, my intent in this is really to, um, as I think it was Council Member Brown mentioned, you know, this was a pilot. We're learning as we're doing this. So, I, I mean, I don't look at this um, revision of the contract as a uh, necessarily a mistake or a pullback. I think it's just a reflection of not only the, the trends that we were seeing and the trends that were predicted by your original analysis, but also um, reflecting, obviously, the obvious issue right now, which is the COVID-19 restrictions and probably very likely changes in behavior ahead. But in general, I think this is a program to um, Council Member Byers' um, comments. This is a program we want to keep building and we want to see success from. So um, I would just see if the maker of the motion would entertain those, those changes. Vice Mayor Myers, will you uh, please repeat the uh, language you'd like to add? I'm sorry, my internet cut out for just a moment. That's all right. Also, oh, I believe you. Um, I believe you follow the staff recommendation. Um, so I would, I would make the motion. Um, the, the the original language is consider the impact of the first um, six months of the expanded Go Santa Cruz uh, transportation demand management program for downtown employees, and direct staff to renegotiate the contract with Santa Cruz Metro with by amending the payment clause of the contract to reflect an actual cost model with yeah. allowances for metro um for metro costs yeah that sounds good i accept you for a moment thank you yeah and if if i could just say yeah i i would accept that too i thought that was kind of implicit in the because it's it's laid out in the staff report, but I absolutely support going that route. Okay. So we have a friendly amendment made by Vice Mayor Myers, which was accepted by Sandy Brown, or Councilmember Brown who seconded the motion, and Councilmember Watkins uh, who moved the item. Are there any further um, questions or comments on this? Hearing none, I'll turn it over to the clerk to uh, call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Spires? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Uh, aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we'll Look forward to seeing what comes out of the negotiation process. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, that concludes item number 19 on our agenda and brings us to our last item on our agenda, item number 20, uh, which is the fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021 budget update related to financial impact of coronavirus, shelter in place, and the shelter in place mandate. Um, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, this is an item you want to comment on. Uh, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Uh, the order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. And I'll just mention to the public that we're gonna um, put the phone numbers on the screen again after uh, questions from council members so that uh, you all can have an additional opportunity to see those numbers and call in. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cheryl Fife, Acting Finance Director, to provide um, the uh, budget update. Yeah. Mayor, I was gonna do a, a brief introduction and then turn it over to Cheryl. Sure, that, that's okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, I was just gonna do a very brief introduction and uh, kind of a big picture overview. And then Cheryl will do a presentation where she'll review the uh, specific impacts to the city and then the recommendations before you. Uh, but uh, just to uh, kick it off um, very briefly, uh, as you all know, really what's driving our budget these days is like many other things, it's the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, it's something that uh, is uh, 
uh, affecting every single agency uh, in, in the country uh, right now and, and probably in, in the world. Um, and I just want to point out that it's important to recognize some sort of uh, big items around the impacts. Uh, first, that the, the fiscal impacts uh, that we're getting from the COVID-19 uh, is, is different in, in many ways from past economic downturns. Uh, for example, the the immediate uh, the impacts are more immediate. The economic and social impacts are more immediate. Of the shelter at home, the essential businesses only that are operating, and the un unemployment uh, is, is growing much faster than than it would during a recession. Uh, on the other hand, the state is in much healthier fiscal position than it has been in the past when we've had a recessions. Um, and also, we were in a, in a, at a point where we were projecting you know, stronger uh, local revenues uh, when and this started. Uh, and so we were in a, in a relatively uh, positive fiscal position starting off. Uh, also, uh, overall, cities are now more or less, are less dependent on state funds than they used to be. Um, and so that helps. Uh, and then also, uh, uh, on the flip side, uh, the the human capital and infrastructure that we have in place because we were in a relatively good, good place, uh, both locally and at the state level, uh, provides uh, the, the much needed support to respond to, to the pandemic. Nonetheless, uh, cities, uh, and there was a recent uh, survey that was done by the California cities that uh, quantified all of this, but cities are bracing for really a nearly $7 billion general fund shortfall over the next two, two fiscal years. Um, and, and you'll, you'll hear about ours. Uh, and this shortfall will grow by billions of dollars, millions of dollars for us if uh, the stay away, or I'm sorry, the stay uh, in place uh, home orders uh, are extended into the summer months and beyond. So uh, these numbers can, can change. Uh, and then all cities, as I mentioned, regardless of size and, and geography are being impacted, so we're not alone. And, and certainly there's also uh, the fact that the uh, cities that are more severely impacted are those that uh, have a high dependency on the sales tax and, uh, and, the, and the, the hotel tax. Uh, and uh, from the survey, over 90 cities in California report that they're considering you know, cutting for low income city staff or decreasing public services uh, as a way to address this or, or to take both, take both, that, both actions. Um, and so really every city is having to respond and, and we're not in the exception there. So before you are, we'll, you'll, as you'll hear, will be recommendations on how we can begin to respond to our, the fiscal uh, challenge that, that we're facing now as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cheryl uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Martine. Uh, good evening, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Mayors, mayors and council members. Um, I'm about to give you the update, um, our budget update as, it, as we see it at this moment. So uh, could I have next slide? Okay. So, um, we're here today to request that council authorize and ratify the fiscal year 2020 budget saving measure direct staff to develop a fiscal year 2021 budget with $6 million in, dollars in spending reductions. Uh, also direct staff to closely monitor the events and impacts associated with the COVID-19 shelter in place mandates, uh, measure those impacts and report back to city council in May. And also establish a budget committee comprised of the mayor, vice mayor, one council member to assist with the review of budget scenarios and proposals that may have to be considered in between the fiscal year 2021 budget release and adopting adoption and during fiscal year 2021. Next slide. Okay, our agenda uh, comprises of uh, a forecast, projections, shelter in place, uh, uh, SIP revenue impacts, budget saving measures, and then our next step. Next slide, thanks. Um, in regards to our forecast, the COVID-19 recession, as Martine had said, is, is different from the Great Recession of 2008. And that's primarily due to an unknown key component, which is the length of the shelter in place mandates. In addition, 
necessary and vital data for forecasting is not yet available. Next slide. Um, the assumptions in this forecast. Um, we prepared uh, a forecast for you that incorporates the following and uh, we anticipate the easing and end of shelter in place mandates in the first quarter of fiscal year 2021. In addition, we're projecting major general fund revenue declines of up to 25% in the first quarter of fiscal year 2020, continuing through the first two quarters of fiscal year 21 and then followed by a rebound in the last two quarters of fiscal year 2021. Next slide. Here's our unknowns. Um, although we're predicting the ease or easing of a SIP in the first quarter of fiscal year 2021, this may be extended. At this time, we don't know if the city will receive state or federal aid. And uh, we can't project, project the, the time needed for the economy to recover because the amount of time is dependent on the length of the, of the shelter in place. And lastly, we're impacted by an unknown future uh, shelter in place mandates. Next, uh, this slide here represents um, our five year financial forecast. And I'd like to start by letting you know that all forecasts are always created with a reasonable degree of uncertainty. But uh, cities and counties agree that we've never been faced with this, an uncertainty to this degree. That being said, um, the, the five -year, this five-year financial projection is based on current information, and we're pretty confident at this time on with the current information. Again, that information might change. Uh, uh, it's changing at a, a faster degree than we've ever experienced before. So if you look at, um, we ended fiscal year 2019 with almost a million dollars in surplus. Um, but now with uh, the shortfalls that we expect in the um, fiscal year 20 in our major revenues and other revenues, uh, we're projecting a $10.4 million deficit at the end of fiscal year 2020. Again, and the, uh, at the end of fiscal year 2021, we expect a, a $6 million deficit. And then in fiscal year 2022, a $3 million deficit. And as, and as the projection goes, uh, we, we expect that we'll start, being, um, we'll start having surpluses beginning in fiscal year 2023, but they're modest, as you can see. Next slide. This is a six-year uh, fund balance projection. And uh, again, the, the previous slide, the deficits pre projected have the following impacts to the city's fund balance, the city's general fund balance available, uh, this, the, I'm sorry, the city's general fund balance. Um, the city, again, the city ended um, fiscal year 2019 with a positive $2.7 million fund balance. Unfortunately, due to a projected loss of 10 points, 10.4 million at this fiscal year end, we're projecting a deficit fund balance of 7.7 .7 million. And also cumulative losses are projected to continue through the end of fiscal year 20, 2022, where you'll see uh, our projection of a, a negative $16.7 million in, in our fund balance, in our general fund balance. And that's unless we enact budget saving measures or receive aid from either the state or federal government. Next slide. Okay, this um, this is a impact to our major revenues, our major general fund revenues, and uh, the major general fund revenues that are in this uh, slide are property tax, sales tax, utility tax, and tra transit occupancy tax, or TOT. Um, it gives you a visual impact of the projected shortfalls of three of the city's four major re general revenues, and that would be sales tax, utility tax, and TOT. We're not expecting any COVID-19 impacts to the city's uh, general fund from, uh, from its top source of property tax through the next two fiscal years, but the total impacts to the aforementioned Sales tax, utility tax, and TOT are expected to fall short of original projections in the amount of 10.0 million in fiscal year 2020 and 4 million in fiscal year 21. And you'll see that V-shaped dip uh, that, that's expected with this recession. Okay, next slide. Okay, in summary, the city is not projecting any negative.
negative impacts to property tax revenues for the next two fiscal years. A 25% decline in sales tax for fiscal year 2020 and a 20% decline in the first two quarters of fiscal year 2021 and rebounding in the last two quarters of fiscal year 2021. And even though we're projecting a rebound in the last two quarters of fiscal year 2021, sales tax re revenues um, for 2021 actually project a 17% reduction from sales tax revenues um, that were that we budgeted for 2020, fiscal year 2020. And, the, and in TOT, um, the uh, shortfall represents a 13, in 2021, the shortfall recommend, uh, rep, represents a 13% a reduction in uh, TOT. Next slide. Okay, these are the uh, budget saving measures that we're, uh, that we're, enact we're hoping to enact in fiscal year 2020. And uh, they include, first, a hiring freeze that is actually already in place. And we also plan to draw down from reserves. And finally, the city departments have been instructed to defer spending. Next slide. Okay, these are the uh, fiscal 2021 possible bu budget saving me me measures. And since we're facing a, a year end deficit in fiscal year 2021 of $6 million, the city is prepared to implement the following budget saving measures. Um, hiring freeze will continue and we will reduce personnel costs and, and expenditures. We also may defer transfers from the general fund and we're actively pursuing reimbursements and loans. Next slide. Okay, most of the cities, as Martine had mentioned, most of the cities are enacting the same budget savings measures and they're in the same financial position. Um, but cities also need to, uh, need from the following, from the state. Uh, they need to, uh, the state needs to establish a city revenue stabilization fund. Uh, the state needs to provide stimulus funding set aside CARES Act funding for cities with populations under 500,000 and create a financing vehicle for cities. Um, next slide. Um, these are our next steps in the fiscal year 2021 budget pro uh, process. Uh, we plan to release the proposed budget on May 1st, 2020. Uh, fiscal year 2021 budget hearings will be held on May 12th and May 13th, if, if needed. And we expect to adopt the fiscal year 2021 budget on June 23rd, 20, 2020. We also anticipate check points to return to council in September, December, and mid-year, but in the mid-year budget in February. Uh, in addition, to assist with the review of budget scenarios and proposals that may have to be considered in between the budget release and budget adoption, and as we head into the new fiscal year, it is recommended that the city council appoint a budget committee comprised of the mayor, vice mayor, and one council member. Next slide. Oh, you're there. <laughs> Next slide, staff recommendations. Authorize and ratify the fiscal year 2020 budget saving measures direct staff to develop a fiscal year 2021 budget with $6 million in spending reduction, direct staff to closely monitor the events and impacts associated with COVID-19 shelter in place mandates, measure those impacts and report back to city council in May, and then establish a, and again, establish a budget committee comprised of the mayor, vice mayor and council members to assist with the review of budget scenarios and proposals. Um, I think that concludes my, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Next slide. What questions do you have? No, thank you for that presentation. And um, I guess as we all know, as we continue moving forward, that um, the open place is really kind of impacting our community financially, but what we're ultimately, you know, charged with is to also save lives under the oath we all took as representatives from the city. And so um, while well, it's unfortunate that we see these cuts, um, I think that it's important
important that we know that, or that unfortunately we see these uh, reductions in funding and losses that we know that we're doing is if um, all this is happening is because we're trying to save lives in our community. So with that, I'll open it up to council members with any questions that they might have. Council Member Brown. I thank you. Uh, thank you for the updates. And um, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty daunting to look at the, the numbers and, and try to wrap one's mind around uh, how these cuts are going to um, happen. Um, so I just wanted to ask, because the, the, the staff report is provides kind of a high level of generality of what's going to need to happen, and that's understandable uh, considering the unknowns and just the timing. Um, but I'm wondering if, so, um, so I, one thing I'm wondering is uh, when will we, so the cuts will be identified when the, may, the budget is, is uh, released will there be some there i imagine there'll be some messaging but it'd be nice to get some of that detail about where where the cuts are actually happening for i think for the public to understand that as well um, i'm hoping that the budget committee will work on some of those outreach uh, efforts and, and pieces to to help the public understand um what we're up against uh my question is uh, have, we don't have any real sense of what the state or federal government might provide in terms of assistance. Uh, I, I understand that, but I'm just wondering if there's been any kind of tracking of, you know, you know, projecting what that might look like in terms of, you know, FEMA reimbursements and or um, other uh, stimulus efforts that have been kind of under discussion at the state and federal level, um, but mostly FEMA. Do you want me to? You, yeah, you want me to answer it, Mark? Okay. Um, we actually have a. a we're projecting if um, uh, the, if if we if we receive aid from the federal government, uh, we will. Uh, it's estimated to be either six to eight million dollars, and uh, but that is there's a lot of uh, controversy over that. So um, that's still being uh, discussed. Uh, one of the issues is that the federal government doesn't want to provide the cities with a bailout that they feel will be spent on pension costs. However, the city has taken measures to make sure that we're, we're, uh, we've, um, we, we've projected our pension costs and, and have done structural cuts to be able to handle those in the future. Okay. Am I answering you? Yeah. I was just going to add, add to that. So, with respect to um, FEMA reimbursement, uh, you know, we do expect that we, you know, we're documenting like we do uh, for every emergency. Uh, we're documenting our expenses and, and hope to get reimbursement. However, there's usually a long lag time, um, and so it could be a year or more before we receive reimbursements. So it's not something that we can rely necessarily for an immediate uh, assistance. I have to say, though, that the, at the federal level, there is some movement there. We've uh, more recently uh, uh, heard that McConnell is actually uh, now open to uh, including uh, funding or assistance to states and lo localities in the next stimulus package that's coming from the federal government. So that's looking a little bit more hopeful. Again, uh, don't know exactly what that'll be, um, but uh, that's uh, certainly better than it was uh, just a few days ago. Uh, of course, at that uh, if that happens, then we will come back and, and uh, look at what that might be and what the impact will be. So yes, uh, you know, essentially there's going to be three parallel processes that we'll be moving forward with. Uh, one is uh, to uh, develop a budget that anticipates these uh, potential reductions. We'll bring it back to you in May during budget hearings to kind of, uh, we'll try to include it in, in the release of budget, but certainly in May we'll have an opportunity to discuss those and pre present those to you. Secondly, uh, you also are uh, uh, provided direction uh, today during closed session regarding uh, employee discussions with our employee groups. And so we'll, that process will, will continue. And then thirdly, uh, we'll be working with the budget committee uh, on uh, uh, reviewing uh, options and, and scenarios and, and then bringing those also back to council. So 
there will be multiple processes going on at the same time here really quickly to bring back uh, uh, the changes that we might have to make and, and options uh, as things develop. The other thing actually I should just note too is that uh, uh, obviously uh, we don't know when the uh, shelter in place orders will be completely lifted. There is uh, some indications from the governor that uh, they'll start uh, to be eased, but it'll be phased and, and so uh, things will come back relatively slowly it looks like. Uh, so we'll have to try to evaluate that and determine what the impact of that will be for us. It, it varies by jurisdictions. Jurisdictions have different uh, characteristics with respect to their sales tax base, for example, versus their other revenue sources. And so we just need to really analyze it on a pretty specific basis as far as what our sales tax mix and, and what those restrictions that are eased or changed and uh, how those would impact our, our particular situation. Thank you. Um, Council Member Matthews. Yes, it looks uh, the direction that we're being asked to give does anticipate some uh, cutback even within the next few months the direction to the department to um, defer or eliminate projects. So um, I think to the extent we can get steady <laughs> information, the unhappy news is going to start right away, it seems to me. Um, and then uh, going forward, we if we approve this recommendation here, which I anticipate we will, that's just a broad brush and the, the really tough choices are going to come in the budget process uh, the next couple of months looking to the next fiscal year. So frustrating. I mean, to have, to have thought six months ago we were looking at surplus and we got capital improvements <laughs> all off the table now. So. Um, Unfortunately, um, one of the issues I know that we've gotten uh, correspondence on in the last few days has been uh, the future of the city's um, uh, the property-based improvement district for downtown, the merger of the two assessment districts, um, and the implication of the city's contribution to that. Um, that I'm assuming will be one of the things we discuss in the upcoming budget. Discussion. Is that correct? Do you see that in this fiscal year or next or both? How do you see that shaking out? Um, I had an opportunity to, to follow up and talk to uh, economic, economic Development Director uh, Lipscomb um, mm -hmm. uh, about this yesterday. And uh, the effort uh, needs to happen and start off pretty quickly um, if we want to get it done this, this year and, and have it be. Uh, effective within the current year assessments. Um, so sort of waiting till May, it, it just this, this would be too long, uh, I believe. So um, it's just a matter of uh, dedicating the resources to do that. So in my discussions with Bonnie, uh, she mentioned that uh, we, we could do it, we could assist with that. There'd be some trade-offs relative to her staff uh, having to um, uh, change uh, priorities. So I asked her to to uh, put those down and, and communicate those to council, uh, and and then we'll have a conversation about those trade-offs and, and whether to move forward or not, or not. I know there's an interest on the part of the DTA to move forward with those. Uh, I think uh, we're certainly very responsive uh, to wanting to do that. There, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Hybrid also does have fiscal implications for the city, and that our assessments go up. So there's the the the. Uh, staffing resources to, to move forward with putting the bid in place, but also there's also the, the um, uh, cost implications. But we can, uh, at a minimum, get started with the process and then those decisions would come forward to you. There's a number of times that have to come forward to the council for approvals and directions as well. well now that Bonnie is on the line, maybe she can add actually to it. I just realized she's on the line, she's probably better equipped to answer the question. And, and just, I understand there's staff capacity, there's the calendar of the yeah. Why don't you go ahead, Bonnie? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Ec Economic Development. Yes, I think given the tight timeline, I think even before uh, you've made the decision as a council as it regards to the budget and the deficit, we're going to need to move pretty quickly.
quickly in order to meet all of the requirements for um, the actual assessment district, which includes three hearings, you know, petitions to property owners. So we can commit that time for the next few weeks and um, assuming that we'll move forward on that. And then when you make the decision, that will really be um, the stopping point as far as the, the budget and the deficit when we get to the budget hearings in May. So we can commit that time for the next few weeks um, with the assumption that you know we would all like to move forward if we can financially support it as a city. From a capacity standpoint, it is a big lift um, at the city, so we'll be redirecting some of our business response. Um, one of our uh, part-time uh, staff members, um, I'll move her on to the PBID. We had just been on hold and we're all on COVID response, so I'll move one staff member back to that effort so that we can move forward and we can do that for the next few weeks. And um, if you then approve the budget commitment, which would be a minimum of 160000 it could be as large as 180000 depending on the public benefit element, and we can go through that more during the budget hearings. Um, but uh, from a capacity standpoint, we can make that work, and we're committed to continuing on this path at this, at this time. I just want to add thank you, Bonnie, because you guys all work so hard. <laughs> I can't believe what your department does <laughs> and helping particularly the, the small businesses in the downtown. So I appreciate your, your extra effort on this. Thank you. They're working hard. Councilmember Brown. <laughs> I was reminded of one last question uh, from Cheryl's comments. Uh, just thinking about the possibilities for getting uh, some kind of relief from uh, state and federal government. Has there, do you know if there's been any discussion about uh, getting some relief from uh, paying into our, our PERS obligations, the, you know, the pension obligations? Because I know we have. Uh, worked on an accelerated timeline to meet those obligations and um, the, the change in the, the system that uh, PERS uh, kind of foisted on local governments was, that was a big hit and it continues to be and I'm just wondering if there's any discussion about the PERS board or some authority at the state uh, providing some temporary relief there. Um. There is a concern. Uh, people have uh, brought up concerns of our rates going up because of their investments are uh, they're falling short. However, um, we won't see any of that uh, for another two or three years. So, uh, what we've projected so far is our obligation for PERS is uh, it remains intact. So, uh, at this time, we don't know what those impacts are. The, what I've heard through the league is there have been some discussions around at least trying to contain any immediate potential uh, increases that might occur. So there have been some discussions around uh, asking PERS to at least uh, maintain the current uh, you know, discount rate uh, or PERS rates uh, so that uh, uh, we don't see uh, you know, significant additional increases above what we already are uh, facing. So those are the discussions that I'm aware of. Um, but there may be more along the lines of what you're suggesting. And uh, the state would, and, and the state would have to step in with CalPERS to do any to to help them with that. So, um, Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, um, I just have a quick question, and then I'm uh, I'm prepared to, to make a motion um, unless um, if that's appropriate. Um, did we take public comment yet? No. Mayor? I don't believe we have. Correct. Okay. Um, sorry, tracking things. Um, my question, I guess, is um, regarding sort of the. Um, well, I guess it's just inevitable, but I, I think it's important for the public to understand, for the community to understand um, the severity of need for our capital improvements that we keep we keep pushing back. And um, you know, these are facilities that our community uses every day. And um, so, 
you know, these are our, these are our community centers. This is our swimming pool. These are the things that um, really, as a resident, you you see that decline in in those in the um, both in the facilities as as well as some of the you know just the conditions and things that that need repair and, and maintenance. Um, I guess my one request would be um, that you know as we work our way through this um, that we you know we don't talk ourselves out of you know trying to get back on track with some of some of that um, future funding in terms of um, whether it's a revenue source or potentially we just don't know what the feds or the state may do I mean there could be bonds that we take advantage of who knows how we put everybody back to work but um, I, I just want to just make a statement that you know we don't want to lose track of those of those capital improvements because some of them are, are are greatly needed as we all know so um and i'll i'll be prepared to make a motion after after you receive public comment thank you i had a quick question and maybe this is for the city attorney if he's on the line So um, one of the recommendations, or sorry, not a recommendation, but part of what, what the staff expressed in the presentation was a need to, like a need from the state. And I was wondering, if, would it be appropriate um, within the motions made that we could direct the mayor to write a letter to our state representatives, um, kind of um, asking, you know, with those specific asks that the staff had presented in the presentation? Yes, 
Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's uh, we've we've uh, adopted a budget a balanced budget for the last fiscal three fiscal years. So we've shown ourselves to be fiscally responsible. We've taken measures to uh, to reduce our CalPERS expenditures, and and we've uh, we've made a lot of we've made great strides in, in proving ourselves to be financially responsible, and I, and we can prove that. As we continue our conversations with our federal representatives, we can pull them together and send them so that um, there's really no excuse um, for other members of Congress to say that we shouldn't get this funding. So, um, Vice Mayor Myers. That was a mistake. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Seeing no further comments uh, from council members at this time. Um, we're going to have, uh, for members of the public who are streaming, uh, there's, if there's an item, if you would like to comment on this item, now it's time to call in using the instructions on your screen. If you were wanting to comment on the fiscal year 2020 and 2021 budget update related to financial impacts of coronavirus shelter in place mandates. After you call in, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. Okay, you are free to talk. Yes, hello, wow, fourth time. I've done this before. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I have a Facebook account where I post a lot of stuff. What's going on with our economy is called a black swan event. Adam Bercotta did a really interesting video that I posted on March 31st at 5.30 a.m. So I made a list of about 70 other documentaries, but it seems like if anybody were to look at my Facebook, I'm James Ewing Whitman, in particular a black swan event, it describes what's going on. This is a cyclic activity that happens every 90 years. The last time it happened was the stock market crash of 1929, and the United States didn't get out of that until World War II. This issue is substantially worse. We are in a major crash. So thank you for your time. I'm done. Thank you. Hey, next person, you're on the line. Hi, uh, this is Scott Graham. Um, I think if you're going to ask any of the city staff to take a 10% uh, cut in pay or something like that, that it should start at the top. The uh, city manager and all of the uh, department heads should be willing to double that and if they take a 20% cut in their pay, in order to ask the people below them to take a 10% cut in pay. The other thing I wonder is, um, you know, the last time the stock market went down, I don't think any any city or county went after CalPERS for sitting there and watching the money disappear. And uh, is there any thought of doing that this time, to actually sue CalPERS and say, you guys are mismanaging all these funds, which is costing us – Dearly. So um, hopefully we can get through this and, you know, the feds and the state will step up and offer cities and counties a little bit of, uh, you know, some crumbs here and there to help us get by. Um, but this is really, you know, a serious issue here as to where the funding is going to come from if all of our tax money dries up. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mayor Cummings and Council Members. Um, my name is Abra Allen, and I am the Interim Executive Director for the Downtown Association. And I'm calling in reference to the um, PBID, or the Property-Based Improvement District, that was mentioned earlier um, in the context of the budget. I just wanted to start by thanking Bonnie Lipscomb and Economic Development for their willingness to help move this effort forward. Um, by now, most of you have probably received uh, many letters of support from our business and property owner community, and if they didn't believe and if we didn't believe that this PBID um, could truly be pivotal 
support in the rebuilding of downtown after this crisis. We should, certainly would not be pushing to move it through at this moment. Um, so I really appreciate all of you and your consideration um, as we move forward with this process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing uh, no further um, members of the public who'd like to speak on this item, I'll bring it back for action and deliberation. And I think I believe Vice Mayor Myers, you said that you're prepared to make a motion on this item. Yes, I am. I'll go ahead and move the item. Um, the staff recommendation um, and a motion to authorize and ratify the fiscal year 2020 budget saving measures. Uh, direct staff to develop a fiscal year 2021 budget with six million in spending reductions. Direct staff to closely monitor the events and impacts associated with COVID-19. Shelter in place mandates measure those impacts and report back to the city council in May. And establish a budget committee comprised of the mayor, vice mayor, and one council member to assist with the review of budget scenarios and proposals that may have to be considered in between the mm -hmm. fiscal year 2021 budget release and adoption and during uh, fiscal year 2021. I'll add just a, an additional uh, item to that motion to um, ask uh, both the budget committee and city staff to track state and federal legislative efforts and advocate on behalf of the city um, as appropriate for uh, state and federal um, relief and uh, recovery funds. If that's, if that's uh, amenable to the mayor and, and, and if that is what his intent. I'll second that. Uh, so we have a motion made by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Council Member Golder. Um, and I think that, yeah, that all sounds appropriate that we continue advocating and I think writing a letter is, is a part of that, is writing letters to our legislators uh, is a part of it as well. So, okay. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, we'll ask the uh, clerk to call the roll call vote. Right, right, right. Uh, I was just acknowledging that Vice Mayor Myers incorporated in her motion. Right. Um, I was just clarifying that that your part about the state representative and that one slide is included in the motion, right? I believe so, because Vice Mayor Myers, you were saying to advocate on behalf of the city. For the federal efforts. The state and federal, yeah. Oh, you're... You're muted, by the way. Yeah, I was trying to capture kind of the extent, whether it's state or federal, in keeping um, and advocating. I, I think, in, in addition to writing letters, um, you know, we may we may do other things, such as um, communicate to Congress directly um, via webinars. You know, there's it's the pathway is unclear, so I think just sort of capturing it as ab advocation, advocating. Um, and, and doing that, uh, advocating for uh, along those lines of state federal funding. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, I just one other thing. I'm, yeah. I have just one other quick question before you, you take the vote. The other, the other item, action item was, uh, I'm not sure whether you want uh, the appointment of the third member to the committee. I'm wondering if by the mayor or does that take council action? It, it's up to the city council. You can uh, defer, you can uh, delegate that to the mayor or you can make the appointment, whichever you prefer. Council member Watkins. Uh, I'll, I'll just say I'm comfortable with the mayor and the vice mayor determining who the third council appointment should be. Council member Byers, do you have a comment? Yes, well, I was also just going to add, I think it should be a mayor's appointment, and of course, working with the vice mayor makes sense. So. Yeah, if I could just chime in, I agree that's the way it's been done in the past uh, with this committee and, and many others, but um, with the budget committee, certainly for the past two years, that's how it's been done. So I think that makes sense. Okay. So, um, so the appointment will be made by the 
the mayor in consultation with the vice mayor. I understand how that will work. Uh, seeing no uh, further comments, I guess we'll take we'll make the roll call. Council members Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Cheryl, for the presentation. At this moment in time, we are going to uh, move into our oral communications period. However, prior to that, um, we had some technical difficulties early in the day, and uh, the public was not able to make comments on uh, our consent agenda items or item number 16. So at this time, if there's any member of the community who would like to speak on items from our consent agenda, which is item number four, through 14, um, this is an opportunity for you to call in and make comments on those items. After comments on uh, our consent agenda items, we'll move on to comments on item number 16 that was on our agenda today. And after comments on item number 16, we will then begin oral communications. So, um, if you are streaming and watching this meeting, uh, this is the time to call in using the instructions on the screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set for two minutes. And so as I mentioned before, currently we'll start with our items that were on our consent agenda, items numbers four through 14. Hello, I want to talk in the open comment, so I should hang up and call back? Uh, just keep your hand down for now. Then I'll Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Seeing no members of the public who would like to um, comment on our consent agenda items, if you would like to comment on item number 16, which was the introduction for publication and ordinance amending sections 3.08.030 and 3.08.100 of and adding section 3.08.091 to the Santa Cruz Municipal Code to establish regulations for the use, award, and evaluation of best value project delivery methods for construction projects from the Water Department. If you'd like to comment on that item, please call in now and uh, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Okay, seeing no members of the public who want to comment on item number 16, we will now move on to oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. An instruction should be on your screen as follows. Call one of the following numbers. If the first number you dial is busy, continue to the next number until you get through. You can call in at 1-669-900-9128, one 7799, 1312-626-6799, 1646-558-8656, 1253-215-8782. You'll need to enter the meeting ID number 940-6659-8281. And when prompted for a participant ID, please press pound. Please make sure to mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. 
please note that there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. If you are interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. You will have two minutes to speak. And um, with, if Robert Norris is on the line or when he calls in, he has requested four minutes on behalf of Huff. And so uh, when Robert Norris is on the line, please make sure to announce yourself so we know who you are. And we'll move forward with um, public comment or oral communication. Okay, I think it's Robert Norris is on the line. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I I, I, heard, I heard earlier the city council essentially unanimously support the city manager's uh, decree attack on food not bombs masquerading as a health problem or a spacing problem and so forth. Susie O'Hara has darkly raised questions about congregate eating places, but has no worries apparently about the 500 to 600 she says are closed into group shelters instead of being properly dispersed to motel rooms currently vacant. How much food is actually available to those outside now when compared to what Food Not Bombs provides? O'Hara has pretty words but omits specifics. Unanswered questions I asked this council two weeks ago. How many of those crammed into unhealthy shelters have been offered the option of a motel room? How many have been tested for COVID-19? We heard that there were negative tests for those who were tested, but we weren't told how many were tested. Was everyone who requested a test given one? How much of the FEMA and house key money has been spent, and what are the medical vulnerability criteria? Is it not obvious, for example, that those outside who die on average 20 years earlier are heavily more vulnerable? If not protected, they become transmission vectors, do they not? What about those outside the COVID-19 Petri dish shelters, the people outside, not just those in the shelters crammed in? How many of them have been offered testing resources, bathroom access, fresh drinking water? These are not rhetorical questions. These are specific requests for information from the city and county that have been ignored. Out of the hundreds of thousands available, how much of this money is being squandered on salaries and administration? The big questions are really, well, the specific one is how much money is being spent on a daily basis to provide food, survival gear, trash pickup, porta potty or bathroom servicing, laundry and shower access, and electrical recharging capacity, basic survival needs for the overwhelming majority who are currently without shelter. Please specify the services being made available and their costs in each of these categories. Susie, are you listening? Please, if you are, take action and respond to these questions. Also, indicate how much of the money available is going for salaries, offices, and other administrative overhead. 600 people sheltered, that sounds good, but almost all are in congregate shelters. This is not specifically not recommended by the CDC. We know about the San Francisco outbreaks, where they were prompting the supervisors there to demand the mayor use FEMA the room key and other funding to open up motel rooms for 4,000 or more people. O'Hara smilingly assures us we have housed 27 people out of a population of 1,000 to 2,000 homeless folks here. So the issues I and other activists have repeatedly raised continue to be ignored. Why isn't the city commandeering motel rooms to deal with the public health crisis and reduce transmission risk now, not hopefully, as Susie O'Hara is endlessly full of hope. And I, I continue mentioning Susie not because she's a bad person, but she is the person who mouths these excuses and ducks these issues. She's still figuring out how to help these, those with vulnerabilities. Uh, she claims only 27 people who are over 65 are outside and medically vulnerable. This defies my common experience. Medically supported detox, quarantine facilities, etc., are fine, but in the meantime, use those motel rooms now. Community members have to raise their voices in ways that can actually be heard, even in the safe, distant, comfortable homes of you policymakers. The idea that congregate shelters are okay if you have inadequate staffing is an interesting claim, but how much money is left? How, how, how much of it has been spent on the staffing? How many bathrooms? 
I think that's my, is that my cue to stop? Yeah. Thank you, and uh, answer the questions, please. Next speaker, you're on the line. Yes, hello. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I have two minutes. Uh, someone, I'm going to quote somebody that said, the pathway is very clear. Um, we're, the Earth's biosphere is having some serious issues, and there's a lot of scientists that are writing stuff. I wrote down while I was waiting 47 names of people that put on productions. Some of them put, have put out hundreds of productions. I'm going to mention three. Dane Wigington, um, number 223, I published, uh, well, he published on November 16, 2019. Um, I wrote it on my wall, April 24th, 2020, 5.37 a.m. Dane Wigington also published something very important on April 25th that I published at 3.50 p.m. Um, I'm almost done. Dr. Tom Cowan. Aligning with Life Energy, I published April 24th, 2020, 8 p.m. That can be found on my Facebook under James Ewing Whitman. Um, I've also been quite critical of Mr. Bill Gates. Um, I published something on his blockchain theory April 27th at 8 p.m. He took, you know what, he took Joe DeBarto's 1960s work and did something very scary with it. Um, I'm concerned for uh, Santa Cruz and the rest of the planet. That's it. Thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate all of you. I'm done. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hey, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for doing this on Zoom. Uh, I'm realizing this is this is probably more accessible to a lot of the families that you usually can't get on or come to city council meetings. Um, I'm probably gonna let people know because maybe it'll be a little bit less intimidating uh, even if they hear the uh, usual suspects. Uh, at least now uh, people, people can dial in, tune in and uh, make a comment. Thank you all, thanks all for being here. Thank you. Okay, this is Gary Phillips. Uh, uh, I would say the, the first major political problem the United States has is that the actions of the corrupt, immoral, rich, and powerful, including co-conspirator enablers in government, are mostly unaccountable to the people. The second major problem is that the dissatisfied, the resentful, the ungrateful, the oppressed have fallen prey to the allure of a utopian fantasy of a revolution abandoning principles of individualism, liberty, and other made of principles that our most successful nation of all time was built on. These are the socialist, communists, and leftists. Their idea that some totalitarian central authority can have a contract with the people that if the people only gave up their liberty, free will, and obey the supposed all-wise beneficent government, everything will be taken care of and end all suffering. Historically, this practice of eliminating dissent, different opinions, and centralizing economic control has been a one-way ticket to bad economics, death, and even more suffering. The socialists, the communists, uh, and leftists have it wrong, and what is needed instead is to restore accountability of our government. What is needed instead of this division of politics, where one side tries to get 50% plus one vote to dictate politics to the minority, uh, instead we need to all acknowledge that laws should only be changed when there is pervasive, widespread agreement so mistakes can be avoided and only incremental positive change takes place. This takes both equal liberal and conservative voices in rational dialogue. I am so proud of the people of Santa Cruz that they have held two council members accountable for their actions, which did not represent the pervasive opinion of the people. I hope that they will hold accountable or reward other members as appropriate in future elections, and council members should take note the public is waking up to their responsibilities to make the council accountable. So far, I don't really see council recognition of that at all, but November is not that far away. If one-sided leftism was so great or... Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, uh, 
uh, thanks for taking my call. This is Eric Rodberg. On the uh, Monterey Bay Community Power Payment Deferral for two months, um, what the mayor didn't mention is that it's being paid for by uh, raising the rates for um, the next six months. And um, they're couching it in different terms, but in effect, that's what they're doing. They're raising rates. Of all the entities that are deferring payments, be it um, creditors, landlords, PG&E, any other, I haven't heard of a single other utility that has the gall to actually raise the rates in exchange for a deferment. I would like city council to push back on that. I, th I think it's wrong, especially since this is a public agency. That leads me to my next point, which I wanted to circle back to the uh, natural gas prohibition that you guys passed last week. <clears throat> I understand the need for urgent action to prevent further climate change. I actually have a, a photovoltaic array, a solar thermal system, and I drive a battery electric vehicle. That's what BEV means, um, Vice Mayor Myers, not that technical definition that um, <clears throat> Mr. Hurley gave. But um, my point, I think there was a lot of misdirection on staff's part. I think we need to do this in a smart way. And, and what my major point is that we don't have a renewable grid, not even close, and that by increasing the load, the electric load, what you're gonna end up doing most likely in the short and medium term is increasing greenhouse gas emissions because we are heavily reliant on natural gas for electricity. And so while I support the the other point, which I think was sort of glossed over, is I think this is a very, very consequential change. And even if I'm wrong, I don't think that most of the citizens of Santa Cruz know that this is, has gone down. It wasn't covered in the press at all. And it's really not an urgent thing. And I would really urge you guys to take another look at this and bring it back. It's discussing once the lockdown's done. Thank you. Again, I would like to let members of the public know that this is oral communication, and it looks like we have one last, one final speaker uh, with us at this time. So if you'd like to call in, now is the time to do so. Uh, the phone numbers should be on the screen in front of you. And after you call in, please press star nine to raise your hand, and we will acknowledge you and give you two minutes for public comment, for oral communication on the stage. Good evening, this is Scott Graham. Um, the thing I'm wondering about is when is the city going to have some sort of uh, document ready to say this is our strategy on working with the homeless people out there to make sure that they don't get COVID-19. Um, there was an effort made a few council meetings back to actually agendize such a thing and that didn't happen. And it seems like the city is dodging this entire issue of like, what is the, what is the strategy? And I'd like to see something come forward. Uh, <clears throat> other than that, the other thing I wanted to say was about this meeting. Um, because every council member is using a different computer or whatever, they're coming through differently. Um, Council member Matthews, you, you break up a lot. Um, some of the people are very, their voices are very distant. You can hardly hear them. The other thing is lighting. Uh, most of you have really poor lighting. You have the walls are backlit, so your face is in the shadows. Um, there's a lot to be done with lighting. Justin seems to be the only one that has good lighting, and that, that may be because he's a photographer. Um, so m maybe you guys need to like work on this a little bit, and possibly the city could issue you a common computer so you're all using the same system, so you're all coming through in a, in a more clear and concise manner. Thank you. Goodbye. All right. Um, looks like there are no additional 
speakers, and so we will conclude oral communications. And before we go tonight, uh, I just want to remind folks to visit both the city of Santa Cruz's website and the county's website for more information on COVID-19, including information on homeless response. And so with that, um, I will adjourn the meeting. And thank you all, all the council members and staff for your time today. And thank you members of the community for joining us. Uh, we'll all get through this together. Um, um, and thank you for your time. Thank you.